you know, thanks for what you do with your podcast and all the rest. Uh, you're doing a great job. Hope everybody keeps tuning in. You get a lot of good info, a lot of insights, understandings of how to get strong, how to stay strong, how to use your strength. You do a great job, dude. <laughs> you make things better than they are in real life, I think. If you don't follow Massonomics, y'all do it. Social media, uh, website, everything. Massonomics. Yeah. Welcome back, everyone, for episode 308 of the Massonomics Podcast, the lifting podcast about nothing, recorded live from Western Northeast South Dakota. My name is Tanner. And my name is Tommy. Tommy, we got all kinds of hot new items fresh off the press this week, don't we? Mm-hmm. Uh, including the shorts heard around the world. It's kind of like the shot heard around the world. They are. It's the shorts heard around the world. They are the, the shorts heard around the world. Um, but before that, I want to tell you about a couple things. First one on my list that I really wanted to talk to you about was the Hybrid Training and Strength Coach app. The Hybrid Strength Coach app is here, and it is stacked with the most popular hybrid training programs, coaching videos, exercise demonstrations, and instructional images to ensure your technique is on point. They have world-class training programs designed by the greatest minds in strength delivered straight to your mobile device. The Hybrid Strength Coach app sets a new standard for the industry, providing a streamlined platform for athletes of all backgrounds and putting the power of the strongest team right in the palm of your hands. The Hybrid Strength Coach programs include access to program-specific private Discord communities for live access to real-time feedback from the hybrid coaches. Visit them at hybridperformancemethod.com. Make sure to use our discount code there. That discount code is MASS, and it'll save you a massive 5% on the lifetime of your membership for that Strength Coach app, or for any of their training and nutrition programming. 5% off, code MASS, hybridperformancemethod.com. Another thing I wanted to talk to you about was... Do we got to do two of those or not? Yeah, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you got to do another thing. Yeah. Another thing like on a piece yeah, of paper. No, yeah, no, yeah, another... another. are getting so natural at these it's, it's not, that yeah. I can't even... I don't even know anymore. See, nobody knows if this is really an ad or not. I'm yeah. literally watching you go yeah. right into the ad read, <laughs> and I'm being tricked. <laughs> like, is this an ad? Woo! Uh, you gotta no, sit back and enjoy the this show. This isn't an ad. I just wanted to tell you uh, how much I've been <laughs> enjoying the strength code plates at Massonomics Gym. Oh, tell me more. They really have become, and I say this with 100% honesty, um, it almost feels like I haven't said this before, but they really have become the go-to plates of Massonomics Gym. I have to mention myself that I, just out of bad timing, I guess, had not got to use the rack that has the strength code plates uh, on it yeah, for yeah. a couple weeks yeah and i just used it the other day and man they're nice you went right to it too, i went right you? to it i said enough of this i have to go back to these yeah they're uh e-coded of course and i've said it before but the e-coat finish on those last like you would not believe it's no joke that finish mm -hmm. um and the styling of it I, you know why is it that why there's a reason everyone goes to those plates i think it's uh, the way that they look and the way that they feel. It's that classic styling. It is. It's like the old friend you can always count on. It is. Um, and the beauty of it is, you know, there's a good guy behind it. Big Grant is running it. And uh, as we like to say, he really has become the buddy caps of our generation. <laughs> he has, yes. He addressed the known issues. It was uh, during uh, supply chain issues of 2020. And he said, he I'm just the man a major iron shortage. Yes. And he's like, I'm going to address these. And here we are today. And uh, we've I've been seeing the strength code plates pop up in all kinds of gyms. See it on our Discord community, on Instagram, everywhere, all over the place. They look just as good everywhere else as they do in our gym. But I'm a personal favorite, uh, personal fan of the ones at Massonomics. And gym. now I know what everyone's thinking. Where do I get myself a pair of these? TheStrengthCo.com. It's that simple, isn't it? That simple. All right. So thank you, the Strength Co. Thank you, Tanner. Like always, we got a lot to cover today. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, it's been cold as a witch's titty oh out there. Oh my you know? God. <laughs> it has been very cold out and uh, not even just cold, really windy, like really windy. It's not the cold that gets you, gets you <laughs> it's the wind, right? Yeah. Uh, it think, has been like negative 30 some degree wind chill. Yeah. I think right? my phone this morning said negative five feels like negative 35. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty cold. Yeah. It's pretty brutal. And we got a decent bit of snow out of it, too. Well, at yeah. least, it, well, it was blowing so much that the drifts were significant. That was the thing yeah. is the drifts. My, the it's way, not the snow total <laughs> inches, it's the drifts it's, that it's get you. It's not just the snow, it's the drifts. I think you said the same thing for your driveway, but my entire driveway stays totally clear, except a foot from, like, directly out from the garage door, yeah. and then it's four feet high. Yeah. 
And luckily, most of it piles in front of the third stall, so I don't really worry about right, that one. Right, right. But yeah, drifting, drifting was going on. The dog loves it. The dog's actually joining us tonight. Yeah, and he loves the snow. He just goes out and jumps around in it like it's the best thing. Yeah, dr- drifts, and we're not talking about Tokyo drift. Uh, no, from, Tokyo drifting up in here. What is that? Uh, Fast and th- Furious. Fast and Furious it, three. I think so. I've actually What's never the seen second that one? one. Too Fast, Too Furious. Okay, naturally. And is that with all the real people? Because Tokyo Drift is none of the... See, I've never seen it. Yeah. I don't know. But what about the second one? Is that like Vin Diesel? Or... I, yeah, I'm pretty okay. sure the second one. And I know I've seen the second one, but I've probably only seen the second one one time in my okay. life. I saw the first... When I was younger, man, I'd watch that first one on repeat. I thought that was like the coolest thing ever. I've... I can recall the first one very well. You know, I've seen that a number of times. Anything... I've actually seen Tokyo Drift probably a couple times. I don't remember any. I don't really know anything mm. outside of those ones. Yeah, I don't. I don't either. That, that's when it started to go from like being a car thing to just like straight up being like a Marvel superhero movie. Right. Like the first the cars one have is, superpowers. Is pretty good though, isn't it? Yeah, it's just kind of like this car heist, yeah. stealing street yeah. movie. Like that was a good movie. I thought I'd, I'd actually love to watch it again because I probably haven't seen it since I was in eighth grade. Yeah. Let's see how it holds up. Very classic. Very classic car movie though. <laughs> yes, it is. Really put the super on the map. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. So talking about the shorts that were heard around the world, uh, the Lyft Shorts 3.0, 3 did uh, debut and have been uh, shipping out all across the country, even internationally. They're on the way to some uh, Canadian followers mm-hmm. and European. Uh, European, they're on the way to those places. But I think uh, within the U.S., they've been showing up kind of yesterday, today, Tomorrow, there's a bunch that are getting delivered to We've people's doorsteps now. We've been getting a great library of fit picks in the in the Discord. So if anyone's really wants to know how they fit, all you got to do is massonomics.com slash join, sign up. You can get in the Discord, and you can see just photos of guys modeling these yeah, things. Yeah, and everyone's putting their height and weight and what size <laughs> they got. And it's uh, uh, you can see plenty of bulges in there. There's no shortage of bulges. Uh, but I think people have been... We, we did end up... We had some... In, internal debate on what uh what ways we can use to best help people understand sizing on these and we end up going with the model shots where it lists the height weight Mm -hmm. what size they're wearing we also did uh come out with a sizing chart (laughs) so i think and sizing charts are hilarious because we did some extensive research and comparison i feel like i own a fair number of brands of shorts and Basically, for me, universally across the board, I wear large shorts. I have I have a lot of brands of large shorts. Yeah. And so you go do comparisons of what these companies say a large short is, and their measurements in waist varies by anywhere between two and seven inches for what a large is. Right. They all basically fit the same, but if I actually went purely off the size chart, I would not have all larges. So I do not get who comes up with size charts. There's some other brands that are pretty adjacent to us in this space that have size charts that I'm like... I don't know how those are up there because well, those I, are not a, just and, yeah, completely and also, far yeah, off of accurate. The, the like, size charts, there are size charts that have sizes in them that actually don't even, those sizes remotely are not sense. rooted in reality no. at all. So, like if you um, went by those, you would go, end up way off. Yeah, I guess it just, it makes people feel better. Like I think ours does make sense, but it's it kind does. of like a weighted average of everything out there in the world. But, right. I think um, if you use all the information available, the size chart and the pictures and, you know, like mash up that information, you can come up with your best, uh, you know, yeah, but, but <clears throat> odds are for most people, there's like two sizes that are going to fit. Though yeah. Too. So it really, and, it also comes down to what your preferences are. And that also is the thing. Like I, I could, as far as the legs go, mediums fit me. No problem. It's just the waist starts to get really tight in a right. medium. Right. Um, and also extra larges fit me just fine too. It's just like they're, they're just bigger. If they're you just want, even yeah. bigger. I don't right. need that much material right. hanging around, you know? Right. Yeah, so. the waistbands are, there is quite a significant amount of stretch there. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it just, but depends on what you like. Yeah. But overall, though, I think they've been going pretty good. Really good. We've gotten some really positive reviews back. Uh, yeah. Some people saying, believe it or not, that we're actually not charging enough. <laughs> that's a, you know, we laugh, but that actually is something that's been said several times now. Yeah. It's yeah. just kind of funny to think about us short selling ourselves yeah. what the hell is the world coming to short here? selling <laughs> yeah, short sell. we're literally short yeah. selling it's the big short uh yeah I, I guess we've talked about it multiple times now like we had no idea going into this product what it was going to be like but yeah we're pretty happy with it yeah and i think uh i think you're going to want to get yourself a pair if you've been on the fence the jury is in you 
are going to want a pair of these. Like you won't, will not be disappointed. The decision's been made. You You'll just probably think that they should have been twice as expensive by the time you get them. Mm -hmm. And you can use code mass. It won't do anything, but you can use it. Right. We'll allow you to use it. You just, it won't do anything. No, I would for sure give it a try. Yeah. <laughs> it may or may not say yeah. yes or no. Yeah. What's uh what's your can action over there? Oh, you got any cans? I could uh um yeah, actually I think this is I think this is a what's in the can tank. Oh, okay. you know, the library's so deep. Well we can I can't play remember the game. everything. You know, I, also, it's not like I'll know. Uh, you know while it's you're, not like I'll Yeah, you won't you you won't <laughs> while you're suiting up over there, Tanner. Um I gotta Bernie, give a birthday, Bernie Stinson. I gotta give a birthday shout out to Bernie over here. He's oh. four four years old today. Getting to be an old man. He that's is uh an old dog. That's almost uh, Submasters in dog years. He is closing in on that Submasters. <laughs> <laughs> Next year, I think it probably hits him, doesn't yep. it? Yep. All right, here you go. There is the can. Okay. It's on open, so I know it hasn't been tampered with. As far as you know. I'm just trying to think if I would get this. It tastes like a Sprite to me. Does it? It really tastes like a Sprite to me, so I'm just going to go with it's a lemon-lime. Uh, it tastes good. It tastes. It does taste really good. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm going to say it's a lemon-lime sparkling water. I don't really have a guess on the flavor. I'm going to say not LaCroix, but I don't know if that's right. So that's my... Well, that's go, my go ahead and take a look here, Tanner. I honestly don't know if we've done this one before. Oh. Well, I was completely wrong. We have a blood orange lemonade. So it's so you got the lemon. You got the lemon part yeah. of the sprite, right? Now let me see if now that I know this, if see, I see, I thought you were gonna get the orange for sure. I thought you were gonna say orange. It does actually. Now that you say that, it does taste more like a orange sun kiss than anything. Yeah. Maybe that's just what I was. Sometimes I'm confused myself on what yeah. familiar flavors I am going up against and. I do think it tastes like a orange sun, you know, an orange soda. Yeah, that is pretty good, though. Kale loves orange soda. <laughs> I do, I do, I do. Ooh. I'd, I'd maybe give this four, four JD Powers oh, I, here. My my first reaction, though, is just that it tastes real good. Mm -hmm. It is delightful. Now, what is a blood orange, though? Does it I, taste like a blood orange? I don't know if I've ever had a blood orange in my life. I don't know if that's a bigger orange than normal, a smaller orange, if that's a regular size orange. I have no idea. Hmm. I would think maybe it's kind of reddish colored. Yep. I wonder how it transfers to a sparkling water, like what they do, use differently in their flavoring. Mm. Do you think there's anything that, like, if this company also makes something that's not blood orange, it's just orange? Do you think that yeah. is 100% right. is it like just even a, a different, marketing yeah, thing? Is it actually a different is flavor Is there anything concoction? different about it? I bet, I'm going to say that there's not. It's, if I had to bet, well, I would bet there is not. This one has the word blood in front of it. That's the difference. <laughs> well, that's what I, yeah, yeah. That is that is like the only difference, isn't that it? That wouldn't surprise me one bit. Like, uh, orange lemonade might not sell the best, but blood orange lemonade. Mm. Now that, that would sell. Yep. Uh, have you noticed the newest challenge making the circles on Instagram? Oh, yes. The um, crate challenge. <laughs> no no not that one it's the, the mannequin challenge <laughs> is that the, someone repost where did someone uh i think it was someone put it in the our mannequin challenge from uh -huh. like we i don't oh. think i don't know if are you in the mannequin challenge that we did uh, i think i recorded it okay i think i used my phone to record yeah, it. yeah yeah so that was like uh, from 2016, I think. Is that what year it was? Yeah, and it's on our YouTube. And someone Is it really on yeah, so, YouTube? Yeah, because someone linked our YouTube to uh, the Mass Dynamics, uh Mannequin Challenge that we did in like 2016. <laughs> and that was we did a pretty good... Did, like, as I watched that, I'm good. like, that's a pretty good Mannequin it Challenge. It was not a bad one. Um, oh, no, but you were talking about planking, right? <laughs> planking, though. That's what, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, the what I don't even know what they're calling it. It's the broomstick. Is challenge. that what it is? The broomstick think, challenge. I think so. Where you put your arms loop them behind a broomstick and, and try and get up. Yeah. Did you have like watching that? Does there any is there any part of you that makes you want to try and do that? Mm, not really. Not really at all. <laughs> um, I just I just see myself hurting myself doing it, like hurting my back somehow, <laughs> or at um, the very least, like hurting your face. Oh, that's like, the other uh, one. Because then I see people always mentioning like, oh, I totally got rug burn on my face. I'm like, I do not want rug burn on my face to say I did some dumb internet no. challenge. 
My thing is I have enough stuff, enough aches and pains. <laughs> like, don't need to be just from putting yourself in uh, uh, dangerous positions to maybe a young uh, for the thrill of it. A pre sub masters me mm. would have been more interested in it, but my sub when you were in the open, yeah, maybe that yeah, you an open about me, it. but no. Uh, yeah, Alan. People are mentioning in the Discord. Alan Thrall did do one that was pretty funny. Whereas it looks like the uh, broom six like sticking up out of his ass, oh, yeah. and, and he's got a ball gag in, and like uh, like he gets up and is like someone that's been like uh, tortured almost. That's like running away. Uh, awesome. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Yeah, there were a few guys that I saw attempted and kind of go down on their face pretty hard. I know, like like uh, John Hack. John Hack had one. The... Russell Orhey had one too, where he it looked like ate shit pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah, that does that part doesn't look like fun. No, <laughs> don't sign me up for that. Um, it is funny the way that those uh, challenges and stuff like that, like just how they kind of go viral. And yeah, and, right. Yeah, like who started it? Where right, did it come from? Right. We'll never know. You just don't know. What's the what's uh you know where does this rank in like the challenges for you? Do you think this is a good? I think this one's relatively. This low. one's uh, what I would consider to be a, f- a bit of a flash in the pan. Yeah, it's not as exciting as. I think the, <laughs> like I feel like the mannequin challenge and all that stuff. That one for was quite a while. that one and that one was pretty big. It yeah, because like, it it didn't involve anything very physical. You know, you right. could just kind of be goofy with it. Right, and it had like that song tied to it. But now almost, I, I don't think that would happen either really anymore because all that stuff happens on TikTok now. Like, right, be such a t- well, but that would still spill over. But it has a lot of that is just kind of TikTok. That stuff almost now, you know? is like what made TikTok for TikTok. Sort of yeah, is. that really would be designer made for TikTok because it's mm-hmm. that Black Beatles in the city was yeah. that was the song, and they would, yep. everyone just would have used that song. And uh, I I do like uh, you know so one of uh, the TikTok one of the TikTok trends I really liked is when uh, it was that Smash Mouth song. Oh, and uh, dude, the beat, those uh, when people like smash their yeah, face. And what was the what song is it? What's Smash Somebody Mouth? Yeah, and they, and they, they do goes, a long pause. That yeah. was that was good. Yeah. The first one I saw was the person walking out of the hockey rink and slams their face in the wall. That actually made me laugh out loud, yeah. which is pretty rare. Same way with that. I want, who was the first person that like was like, yeah, if we use yeah. the the song and just like use a gap right there. It's like, <laughs> body. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that was funny. There's also, along the lines of that, there is a, because you know All Star by Smash Mouth has yeah. kind of a cult um, level to yeah. it. I'm not yeah. going to say like Smash fan Mouth base. in general kind of yeah. does, right? There is a version on YouTube of uh, All Star where it's like 20 hours long, I think. And they just say, it's just like, <laughs> and the years start coming and they don't stop coming and they don't stop coming and they, <laughs> and they don't just stop keep going. Coming. And it just goes and goes and goes. Yeah. It is pretty funny. Yeah. Not for, I don't know if it's actually 20 hours or if it's an hour, but it's, but it's way yeah. long. That part is way longer than it should be. And that's right. kind of how the song goes. <laughs> but it is funny. It's, I like Smash Mouth. I in, in 19, when I was like 10, uh, Dude, 10, 12, that Smash was Mouth one of the was first killer. CDs I ever got there. Uh, walking on the sun. Yep. Uh, that one. Didn't know what it was. Just saw the picture in a Best Buy flyer, and I was in a store. I was probably, what, at the time, fourth grade? Yep. Said, I need that CD, and that was yep. the first CD I ever got. I had that CD, too. It was yep. one of the f- early CDs that I, I had. I thought that. Walking on the Sun was a banging song. <laughs> Me, too. And at the end of it, they had Why Can't We Be Friends on it, yeah. a cover, and yeah. I thought that was awesome, too. Yep. Uh, it was, <laughs> I had a uh, Walkman that I would carry around and listen mm, to that. I didn't have to get that for a few years after that, still. And, um... You know, I had several jock jams of the early jock yeah, jams. Yeah, jock jams went pretty hard back then. Yeah, they had some bangers on there. Yeah. I think it, one of the, some of the first CDs I, I remember buying were that uh, Smash Mouth one and a Sugar Ray, mm, whatever yeah, the Sugar Ray Yeah, that was Ray pretty album. classic then, too. Yeah. Then I had a Wallflowers album. Wallflowers, yeah. Jacob Dylan, right? Yeah, it is Bob Dylan's son, I think, right? Yeah. Have we talked about that on the podcast? I think we before? have, actually. All right. <laughs> I think we've just talked about everything at some point. <laughs> you know, if you talk about old stuff at some point, it's going to be, oh, we've definitely what, talked about it. What's the hit stuff. song off of that Wallflowers uh, album? Uh, One Headlight? Yeah, that's what yeah. it is. Yeah. There right. it is. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Good song. Do you like that song? Oh, it's a great, that's a great 90s song, yeah, isn't it? I, I think so. With one headlight. Yeah, that's a classic uh, 90s that is. song. I love it. There's a lot of shitty 90s songs. There's a lot of good ones too, and that's one of the good ones. Yeah. There's probably a lot of bad songs on that album, even for that matter. But yeah. I don't know. it is funny when you think about how there's a lot of songs that are actually like bad, but it's just the nostalgia factor. Right. Like, oh, no, that was a song I listened to growing up, and that's why you like it. Music. <laughs> yeah. Great stuff. Uh, my four year old, she likes uh, to watch the Macarena. 
<laughs> and um, what's the other one? The Spice Girls. Um, the most popular one. Um, Wannabe. Yeah. Yeah. She really likes that one too. So I've been yeah. hearing that Spice Girls jam. There's something about pop songs like like those top pop songs. They they had something figured out with them. Yeah, where it kind of spans a, time. A uh, three year old like just like it clicks are like, yeah. yep, this is good. Yeah. This is what I like. Yeah. Hey, yeah. right. I know it's pop music. There's something to it. What was what's your favorite Spice Girl? Uh, Can you name them all? Oh, I could name them all for sure. Well, I couldn't name their actual real names. No, but no. Sporty, Ginger, Scary, Baby, and ba- no. Sporty, Ginger, Scary, Baby. Is there five or four? One more. Posh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Married to David Beckham. Okay. Obviously. I didn't know that. Yeah. And which one is Posh? She's got dark hair. Uh, Victoria That's not Beckham. sporty. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mrs. Beckham. <laughs> Married Obviously. to David Beckham. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> yep. Uh, so which one's your favorite Spice Girl? Uh, oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> like me in like fourth grade or me right now? Uh, fourth grade. <laughs> Mm, I don't even know what I'd say in fourth grade. Boy, um, part of me thinks I would have said Sporty Spice then because she was the sporty one. Right. But I don't know if I actually felt that way or not. Not that big on Sporty Spice. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Nowadays, probably you have to say Posh Spice. Probably Victoria She's the Beckham most relevant, is probably the most the, relevant yeah, one right, out of all right. Speaking of things that are relevant, um, did you see that uh, someone, it appears as if they benched 800 pounds? I did see that. And I'm going to tell you the uh, 804.7 pounds. This is Daniel Zamani. Mm -hmm. What country? I don't know. I was just going to ask you. I don't know what the actual country is. I don't know. I'm not sure what country he's from. There seems to be some controversy around it, much like all of his benching. I think we've talked Mm -hmm. about him uh, over the last couple of months also. And it's just... um, I don't know. I can't. Uh, I'm not a forensic video <laughs> to be able to well, tell if it's real or not. But we're gonna run it through the mass you know, enhance machine, right? Just the, say um, enhance a few times. And the the things people would bring up <laughs> is like, yeah, he's kind of got like barely got like a spotter and some side spotters, and doesn't seem like maybe the spotter's all that big. I don't know if you have to be that big. And then maybe people talk about how the weight doesn't bounce that much, like when he re racks it. I don't know. I watched Julius's really heavy ones and. I didn't see that his bounces that much either. If you're mm-hmm. not like really like slamming it down. That is where it's tricky is yeah. where, yeah, just because you don't have a whole lot to compare to for like raw benches on calibrated plates and all that. Right. But, My uh, favorite thing, though, about him and his benching and all of that is two things. Some, some Number one, it's my, my coach <laughs> and pointing to that awful picture of his <laughs> like that, coach. It's like, no, if you want to do that, you just tag him. That's yeah. a way more helpful right. for everyone. Right. Because my like, coach, like, like, are oh, people supposed that, to screenshot There he is. Yeah, yeah. So people are supposed to right. screenshot and do like a reverse Google image search <laughs> to find your coach. Like, no, you just tag him. That's all you got to um, do. But what I actually like better, and I think we talked about this in the gym, is when he walks around before before and every lift, he'll walk around this way and point up like this on this hand, then uh-huh. he'll turn the other way, point up like this on this hand. Like this is, I like this go to, uh, it's go to, yeah, your uh, thing. It's, it's his signature move. Yep. You got to have his, every athlete, <laughs> top level athlete has to have a signature yeah. move, and that's yeah. his. <laughs> and it's it is signature. Uh, I but I think uh, much like what everyone would say is we would like to see that in a competition, real or fake. Or I know. Like let's let's. That see, is uh, kind of the thing. If I don't know, and I think did, him and Julius are supposed to do some bench off against each other at like CT Fletcher's gym. Okay, that'd be. I don't really know cool. if that's ever going to happen, and who know, I don't even we don't even know what country he's from. So what mm-hmm. logistic nightmares I'm are there? I'm pretty sure it's to, the Middle East somewhere. Yeah, that guy is big. There's no oh, yeah. doubt about that. But <laughs> yeah. also, he doesn't look like Ju- he's. Julius no. Maddox probably outweighs him by 100 pounds, doesn't he? Julius Maddox is really big. So yeah. that is the thing. Is yeah. that as big as this guy looks, Julius is huge. Yeah. I don't know. It, yeah, you, you definitely, you got to see in a meet. Like yeah. for, if he just never does a meet, right. well, then it kind of feels like, well, what was... Well, what's his point though? Is just say, what is Like why that? is he doing this training and peaking just to do it in the gym? Like if you could break the world record, wouldn't you be doing that in a meet? You would think so. Even if he goes to a meet and does 750, I'd still say that's a smashing success. Yeah, right, right. Um, I, I, yeah, just to see another guy be up in that area yep. in an actual meet is a big deal. Right. So I'm I'm curious to see what happens with this and how things go. Only time will tell. Only time will tell. That's all there is. 
Big Daniel. Daniel, what did I say again? Zamani. Zamani. Yep. 804.7. I ran it. Looks and like. I would close that with just this. If you're listening, you <laughs> can't tell, but I'm doing this pointing thing up. Pointing like pretty close to your face too, like keeping it real close yeah. to your head. Not like out here. Not uh, like, yeah. It's almost like he's pointing yeah. like he's thinking that is. Yeah, head. yeah. <laughs> you're just not quite sure what it is. Oh, uh, we've got this little segment I wondered if we should bust out. It's mm. actually a relatively new segment. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with it at all, but it's called Supporting Our Supporting Members. I am familiar with okay. it. It's it, one of my favorite and I would actually say it might be one of the fastest growing segments. On the I show. would say it's relatively new and one of the fastest growing. I mean, those things probably work in conjunction that when it is relatively new, it grows quickly. But mm-hmm. uh, we've got a laundry list of supporting our supporting members this week. And what the segment is, is we have this group of uh, Massonomics podcast supporting members. They choose to support us monetarily. And by doing so, they get a, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, number one is they get access to our private Massonomics Discord community. And <laughs> when, which we're looking in, at and laughing right now. Someone put up the look at this photograph, but they have Tommy's. Uh, yeah, just cycling thing. through. Yeah. Um, but they get access to the private Massonomics Discord community, um, which also gets them access to listening to the podcast live as we record it, just like they are right now. Real time. There's uh, discount codes, and they get early access to drops sometimes. They get early information on drops. They're really on the inside pulse of Massonomics. If you're a pretty big uh, follower or fan of Massonomics, it would almost be crazy for you not to jump on and be a part like, of it. Like almost actually insane. Yes. You might yes. have to get admitted somewhere. So uh, to touch on this week's supporting our supporting members, we had several of our members competing this week. Um, number one, Big Andrew Montoya. Uh, West River Andrew. Mm-hmm. From, from, doesn't currently live in South Dakota, but he is a, a South Dakota native. He put up a 1,967 pound total, and he did that via a 772 squat, 463 bench, and 733 deadlift. <sighs> Those numbers are not messing around. No, that's uh, that's that's pretty intense. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, very intense. <laughs> that's a that's a really big total. It is, and pretty um, pretty strong in all three lifts too like he's mm-hmm. closing in an 800 pound squat and that God. does not happen on accident does no, it No, it does not and then it gets to a confusing part so as i try to follow things through the work on throughout the week on supporting our supporting members so i make sure to be prepared for the segment when we do it on the pad- podcast especially since it's relatively new and growing quickly there was two that i didn't realize this until somewhere i don't know when it hit me but there was two sams two big sams competing this weekend that are both supporting members oh really so there was confusion <laughs> okay, okay. and i don't think i was the only one confused in the discord that of which sam was which and then See, the other sam said oh assume, that wasn't me that was the other sam i and just assume there's two of every name in yeah the discord, there, it some of, of them there's like four yeah because that kind of is that way I, every time yeah. i think i have someone figured out i'm like oh no no it's the other person with the same name yeah so the f- one that i'll say is i think big sam and i could still have some of this swapped but i think this is right <laughs> big samuel Nemechek, it was his first ever meet, and he did a 391 squat, a 319 bench, and a 440 deadlift for an 1152 total. Nice. I think I have that right. The other one, Big Sam, goes by Big Sam in the Discord. He had a 490 squat, a 319 bench. So they benched the same? They did. Or do I just have that confused? Well, we'll never know. <laughs> yeah. And he pulled 551 in his first meet going 9 for 9. Awesome. So the, the the Sams really pulled it together, didn't they? The Sams made it happen. Yeah. And then speaking of when we have more than one person's name in the Discord, Big David. Okay, yeah. I think there's yeah, 10 of those. Yeah, right? Big David. Uh, <laughs> one of the Big Davids. He, I think he's actually Big David in the Discord. I know he's got the 8-bit Strongman as his okay, uh, profile yeah, yeah, picture. Yeah. He did a Strongman competition, and I just saw the video. I don't, I don't know how it all shook out for him, but I saw a video of him doing uh, the Denny Stone style carry, mm. almost like a farmer's walk, but it's on, you know, the loading pins like the Denny Stone mm-hmm. and looked like he is, cr- did really well in that event. But uh, I don't know how he sh- shook out all together, but he was competing this weekend. So cool. just wanted to give him our support. Awesome. So that is supporting our supporting members. Yeah, there was a lot of support there. Yeah, and if you want to become a supporting member, what, what's the website again for that? Massonomics.com slash join. That's so simple. So easy. And you just enter in your information and boom, 
we got you for life. Yep. Or until you decide to cancel. <laughs> or, yeah. But you don't want to no, cancel. No, like, you don't never want to do that. You the point is to out. never cancel. Yeah, you get kicked out of the Discord then. So no, not what anyone wants. Um should we read some more ads, Tanner? Let's do it. Okay. I'd love to. This episode is brought to you by Fusion Sport Performance Supplements. Do you know what's in your supplements? If you use Fusion Sports Performance, you always will. Fusion SP prides itself on being fully transparent, never using proprietary blends, and always providing its customers with top quality products. They offer two pre-workout options with Super Soldier Pre-Workout and Mad Titan High Stim Pre-Workout. Both have proven ingredients at their full clinical doses to maximize performance, increase muscular endurance, improve focus, and give you that much sought after pump. Both are favorites among strength sport athletes. Healing Factor Post-Workout combines BCAAs with a full serving of creatine monohydrate and other great ingredients to help maximize your efforts in the gym, build muscle, and recover fast. Fusion's whey protein isolate not only tastes great it also has 27 grams of protein per scoop zero fat and low or no carb options depending on the flavor it doesn't contain any soy or gluten and it won't cause any stomach discomfort available at vanilla ice cream chocolate of some sort and frosted cinnamon roll flavors most orders are shipped within one business day and every fusion sports performance product comes fully backed with a money back guarantee go to fusionsp.net and use code MASS, that's M-A-S-S, to save a massive 20% on your order. Now I'm going to take you on a little trip, Tanner. All right. We're going to go on another little road trip. I Close like your it. eyes and imagine yourself in mid-century Italy. You're a uh, high-ranking military officer dining in the Italian Officers Club. With a little drink like yeah, this. Yeah, the little espressos just surrounded. Yeah. Surrounded, bottomless espressos. <laughs> No limit. Dishes from around the world. You're talking about you're talking about Ferraris and spaghetti mm. and you know the finer things. What in else? Life. Uh, Bugattis <laughs> and uh, Lamborghinis. <laughs> okay, maybe. we'll go Lamborghinis. Um, uh, maybe uh, uh, I'm Gab- just gonna name- maybe Gabagool. Or yeah. <laughs> just gonna name all the sports cars, assuming they're from <laughs> Italian. Every one of them. Yeah. They're all Italian. Uh, <laughs> Alfa Romeos. There you go. Uh, there <laughs> you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, everyone's favorite Italian car. Dishes, dishes from around the world are served on fine silverware, elegant glassware, and gorgeous porcelain. The height of class meant only for the most elite members of the Italian military. Now bring yourself to the frigid Swiss Alps. You're a Urgh. light infantry just soldier. Like home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, no, we're gonna get there. Get I don't want to go to the Swiss Alps on my f- uh, the frigid Swiss Alps on my fantasies. I just yep, no, no, we, we live oh, in yeah. the bottom of Swiss. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you're a light infantry soldier of the Alpine troops, training high altitude drills in whiteout conditions. You're kept warm by a life saving combination of wool thermals, Gore Tex outerwear, and a trusty pair of trigger mittens. Next stop. The even more frigid and freezing and windy Great Plains of Western Northeast South Dakota. You're trying to find the Massonomics gym and you've run completely out of gas, but you've come prepared. Your indestructible NATO fuel can from SwissLink.com has the 5.3 gallons you need to complete the journey to the gym. That is the most important 5.3 yeah. gallons of your life. Yeah. SwissLink offers a diverse and unique selection of authentic military issue gear and outdoor equipment. Save 15% off your first order from SwissLink.com with code MASS at checkout. That's SwissLink, S-W-I-S-S-L-I-N-K.com. Thank you, SwissLink, and thank you, Fusion Sports Performance. Yeah, SwissLink. I've been seeing some people checking that out for the first time. Uh, go. There, uh, there's a lot to take in there. Yeah, go, yes, it, it's a journey just going to SwissLink.com. Mm-hmm. Now should we get our uh, big Jordan on the? I think so. Well, better, better say bye, Discord, right? Yep, see you, Discord. See you, Discord. Oh, what's going on? False alarm. They're still here. No. Oh. I feel like they're watching our every move. For some reason, my keyboard shortcut just went beep. Wouldn't work. Finally, they're gone. I had to use the old mouse clicker. All right, here we go. Hello? Yeah, Big Jordan, is that you? 
That's me. I, right. I like big. Uh, I like big. Yep. I like big Jordan. <laughs> everyone, uh, we we have a, a phrase that uh, everyone at Massonomics is big, no matter what size you are. I like that. Yeah, you're including everyone. I love yeah. that. Yeah, it's uh, uh, we have a gym, and that's kind of the policy there. Every new member gets dubbed as being big, uh, male or female, and um, it's it's kind of like a badge of honor at that point. Yeah, no one. There's no like little Brian. No, or like yeah. <laughs> no, no it doesn't. Right. So we're we're excited to get you on. Uh, I, I'm Tanner, and I'm Tommy. What's up, Jordan? Hey, nice to meet you guys. And uh, I should say, Doctor Jordan Feigenbaum. Am I saying your last name correctly, or am uh, I mispronouncing you, it? No, I think you crushed it. And in the last awesome. twelve months, you're the only person who's got it right. So I feel like <laughs> we should give you another accolade. Like, yeah. <laughs> Something. Thank you. We usually hand out JD Power and Associates Awards. So. Yeah, I was gonna go there. Yeah. yeah, best in class. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, we've we've uh, kind of been talking about getting you on for a while, and we're excited to do it. We've got a lot of stuff to talk to you about, and it's funny we have a, a Massonomics Discord uh, group, uh, kind of a private group there, and we get a whenever we have a guest lined up, we always let them in on who it's going to be and they fire off anything that they kind of want to hear us talk about that sort of thing, or they make their comments about it. And, um, they, when we told them we were having you on, it was about as much activity as I've seen ever before. (laughs) And the number of people and number of topics, they said, if you really want to get Jordan going, talk about X. Oh boy. Right. <laughs> oh boy. Whatever. Good or good or bad, a lot of activity. All right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and no, it, it, none of it, none of it bad, but just kind of fun comments. Like where if you, oh, if you really want to get him going, you, you bring this up. So, uh, you must be no stranger to having some strong opinions on things, I would say. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, I, I feel like part of the allure, I guess, when people ask me questions, is there waiting, is there a rant on the other end of this? And uh, especially early on, you know, when the internet, like online space uh, for strength conditioning goes first, like blowing up, um, it, I definitely was more polarizing, I think, as far as where my opinion were. And then I ended up meeting all these people that maybe I was, you know, inter- interacting with or talking about. And, and in general, everyone's in the space is, they're, they're nice people, you know, or at least trying to be nice or helpful or whatever. So, it's, but there are still some pet topics that, yeah, I mean, I definitely need some blood pressure medication on board to talk about, <laughs> say, to talk about safely for sure. Well, do you find that that's tricky sometimes is that, uh, because I would agree we've, we've had hundreds of guests on our podcast at the time where that, that span such a variety of, uh, viewpoints on things. And we're pretty, we always remain pretty neutral and just like to, you know, give people their forum to, uh, say their thing yeah and, but there is such a uh but everyone is so nice like we've never had like a bad interaction with people too but do you find it hard to like if if you're you're re- going back and forth with those people online or whatever it might be like that you want to hold back because you um then kind of get along with them yeah yeah especially now and i think you know there's a couple things going on like one i was younger right and two it had maybe uh, a more a narrow, more narrow perspective over like, this is what people should be doing, or here's how to think about this in a correct or evidence-based kind of way or whatever. But, you know, people's perception, their lived experiences all kind of go into how they, their belief systems, right? And I think having more of a knowledge about that gives me additional understanding of where they're coming from. Even if I don't agree, I can kind of get to a point where I'm like, yeah, well, I understand what why you think what you do, even if we disagree. And so, if you're going through that level of like analysis of somebody else's belief or statement or claim or whatever, it's really hard to, at the end of all that, be like, yeah, well, you know, you're a jerk. Right. <laughs> you've, mm-hmm. you've, you've, you've kind of connected with them. Right. So I, I don't know. People ask me all, uh, very frequently to like, you know, how do you, you know, argue with folks or what, how do you, you know, how would you convince somebody of this and I'm, uh, of a particular, you know, thing and i'm like well i don't know if you go into a conversation with another human if that's i don't think that's the best way to do it i think you should try to understand where they're coming from and that probably gives you additional perspective that may be useful for your understanding you know and then and only then can you have like a an actual discussion where you're hearing them they're hearing you and at the end you know everybody's better for actually having the discussion if you just want to be a jerk on the internet just say what you believe and then leave leave the chat you know exit uh which which i think is probably maybe where i started and i you know, if I could go back and do some things differently, I probably would not, not because I feel like, you know, I'm never going to be a, a jerk or an idiot in public again, but it, it's kind of like, what's the point of that? 
you know, there's, <laughs> there's so much stuff that we should actually be getting angry about or be passionate about that, like arguing with somebody over like bar placement on the squad or something or like <laughs> deadlift, deadlift mechanics are like, dude, what are we actually talking about? You know, the, the, so just going to battle over just, yeah. How, how people lift. That's always a, yeah, always a I know. One. So yep, yep. you're, you're the founder of barbell medicine. Could you explain, like, put it in a nutshell, kind of what barbell medicine is and what you do with that? Sure. Yeah, sure. So the tagline that I, I like is that we're bringing modern medicine to strength conditioning and strength conditioning to modern medicine. Uh, basically, my background was a uh, gym owner, uh, educator for a large, an educator for a large uh, personal training company in St. Louis. That's where I'm from. That's where I started. Um, and basically, what I was doing while I was in medical school was kind of, I mean, I was, I was immersed in the in the medical space you know learning medicine and, and how to prevent disease reduce risk from disease treat disease stuff like that but then my background prior to that was all strength conditioning coaching folks or whatever so i had this big you know base of knowledge and experience in the fitness world and i was like these two things need to overlap we we in medicine for example we pay lip service it seems like to all this lifestyle change and you can see that in every recommendation guideline you know bullet consensus statement about preventing whatever disease or medical condition or managing it. It's always there, lifestyle. So and that just means dietary intervention and, and exercise. But then when it comes down to the nuts and bolts of like, all right, well, what kind of exercise? How do you, you know, structure the exercise? How do you recommend exercise? What spe any specifics? There's none of that in the medical uh, field. And I'm like, all right, so we need to lease that at bare minimum. And then all of the fitness professionals, like coaches and stuff like that, they're, they're the, if they're treat, you know, working with any human and en enough humans, they're going to be people that have medical conditions, whether it's high blood pressure, type two diabetes, you know, common stuff, or even more rare stuff like uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And, and, and those athletes would be at risk of like sudden cardiac death. And so you need to be, uh, you know, kind of, aware of they need to be aware of each other you know so not only from like a preventative standpoint feel good public health that sort of thing but also for like actually dealing with athletes so in any case what happened is uh, i started this in 2012 and i basically just started putting out information on the internet per pertaining to you know how where these things overlap so for example like what is high blood pressure how does exercise affect blood pressure what can you uh, you know, reasonably expect to see from a person who has high blood pressure if they start exercising. And people seem to really like that. And also nobody else was doing it. And still, even to this day, like, I'm like, where's the barbell medicine version 2.0? And they call themselves, I don't know, like, I don't know what they would call it. They probably just don't, there's, it doesn't exist because there's no good name for it. We took the only one that actually exists. So there's nobody <laughs> like, you know, we can't come up with a name. So we we're just going to not a lost cause. Not, don't even go yeah, there. yeah 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 there's no yeah they can't workshop their way into a name um so yeah it was originally just myself i was just again just putting out information into the into the ether of the internet and uh, i was working with folks uh, mostly from like a strength coach standpoint these people tended to have either um some medical conditions they were worried about or were more like health focused still had some competitive athletes at the time but it was rather small um uh, and then it just expanded. We got Dr. Baraki on board. We got uh, some uh, physical therapists and chiropractors and registered dietitians and other strength coaches and kept growing and growing and growing. And now, you know, we've got a ton of clients all over the world that we're working with like a one-on-one -on -one standpoint. So that's part of the business. The other part of the business is actually putting out, uh, you know, educational content. A lot of it's free. Uh, and there's some stuff that's designed with like, like online, like distance course learning stuff. We do live in-person seminars. And the idea, again, is to bring the two worlds together, strength conditioning, or you could even just say fitness and medicine, and improve uh, uh, their kind of crosstalk. Because they're, they're almost siloed, right? The personal trainers, the strength coaches think the doctors don't know anything, which in many cases, that's true for just talking about like their fundament, fund of knowledge about exercise. That's That may be true. Um, and then the, the medical professionals are like, yeah, well, this person, the personal trainers, you know, may not be the best at actually helping my patients engage in these lifestyle changes. They just are unaware or they're unaware that, you know, exercise can have all these benefits, even though they've been part of these recommendations, these lifestyle recommendations since 2008 that, you know, that's, that's the most charitable sort of timeline I can get. I'm like, well, they've only been around for the last nearly 15 years. So if you don't know about them, you know, maybe you got, you went to school before that, but it's, it's really hard when you, when you look at the actual, data on how many physicians even know 
what the current exercise guidelines are and that they involve resistance training, you see less than 10% of all primary care physicians even know that they exist. And of, of that 10%, less than half of them are actually recommending exercise to their patients. And it's like, what, that's 5%, guys. Like, what the heck? So in any case, it seemed like there was a need there. And uh, yeah, fortunately, fortunately, it's kind of picked up some steam. And uh, the more we can stay out of online uh, internet arguments, <laughs> the better it is for because I mean, we can just put out more content, right? We can put out more yeah. content. And um, I mean, I think it'd be difficult to be in this space if we didn't have a person. Most of the people that work at Barbell Medicine have a personal interest in being, you know, getting really strong or, you know, physical development in general. That'd be difficult just to come at it from like, yeah, well, we're doctors and we know about exercise, but we're not actually like living it, you know, and it's not part of our life, part of our DNA, but, but it is. And so that's why I think we all kind of get along and, um, yeah, maybe maybe some of the initial uh, success or, or recognition comes from like, oh, these are doctors that deadlift over seven hundred pounds. Right. That's cool. I want right, to, yeah. Right. And I'm, I'm like, well, I I wish it could be different in some ways because then you could get more doctors kind of like on board with the platform, like helping folks, right? But uh, so we'll see. We'll just get maybe you know if we get enough a big enough and big enough uh, sample size of other physicians and healthcare professionals that are, that get bit by the strength bug, you know, maybe there's going to be a bunch more uh, recognizable talent kind of in this, in that sphere. We can spread the, spread the knowledge gains, but uh, as of right now, it's, it's just us. So that's, that's cool too. We'll, we'll keep, we'll keep, uh, keep fighting the good fights. That's good. Uh, And something that we've talked about people that, that have used it and they really um, say it's been really valuable for them is, I don't know what you call it, but it's basically like your pain and rehab specific. um, Mm -hmm. Yep, coaching, uh, sure. Yeah, and like that they've they've talked about how that va- just like how insanely valuable that's been to them. Yeah, the the we started offering these like pain and rehab. It's basically coaching. You know, we call it pain and rehab consultations, pain and rehab coaching. The idea was we wanted to offer people uh, physical therapy um, and, and this rehab rehabilitative sort of guidelines remotely because. What would invariably happen is somebody would receive a specific diagnosis. Let's say they had a torn meniscus or uh, even something more uh, like or less specific than that. They have knee pain, right? And they've had knee pain for weeks or months, maybe even years. And we could hem and haw about, you know, how we manage pain, this, that, and the other. But when it came down to actually come up with specific recommendations for the individual and work with them over a period of time, um, it, it'd be, it was kind of hard to recommend folks, yeah, just go see your PT. Uh, may, mainly because there's this disconnect between physical therapists and other professionals in that space at large and like kind of again, evidence-based guidelines for managing pain, particularly in, in active uh, uh, individuals. So we, we almost felt charged that we had to do it. And uh, if I could do anything, I would clone our existing pain and rehab staff uh, a couple times over so we could, we could work with, you know, more people, but that's uh Yeah. I think the uh, overall the, the feedback I've gotten has been similar to yours has been really really good uh, and I, I wish we would have started that earlier because I think there's there's still a huge huge need for that and um, man that it it, it it's kind of crazy to think about where people could go prior to a lot of these online services being offered not just by us but by other other folks in the space like think about if you got if you hurt your back and you're like man I really need some like help here well you'd be you'd be limited by seeing any pt that happens to live in your geographic area and that they may not understand you or what you do and may not be you know the best fit for you and now you're not you're not limited at all you know you can you can get on the internet and do, and do uh, you know kind of pick your pick your professional which is uh is, is pretty neat so like when <clears throat> you know obviously you guys you, you lift so you kind of you don't just uh talk the talk, you know, you, you, you walk the walk, you're, you're coming for, to a lot of these places from a, a spot of experience. Um, you know, w- when you guys, you know, approach someone <clears throat> or when someone approaches you and you're addressing their knee pain, back pain or something like, how do you guys come to that like differently than just your general PT? Like, cause I'm assuming sure. you guys cover a lot of the same stuff in school, but like, how does your approach vary from like your, your run of the mill person you just see in your local area? Sure. Yeah. And and it's obviously, it's hard to generalize uh, just without 
throw in shade at the, you know, right. PT, uh, you know, and I don't want to do that. I yeah. look, I've met a lot of great physical therapists and there's obviously some selection bias there. It's like, Oh, if your PT happens to be really into lifting and you know, our stuff, like you're probably going to be right. mm-hmm. pretty, pretty, right. pretty good, you know? And, and if I've never met you, then the odds of that being true or lower. So, um, yeah, a, a few, a few like key differences, I would say one, instead of focusing on, um, you know, just prescriptive uh, movement changes. Um, we really try to focus on educating the client, educating the patient um, on, you know, why the, the pain experience rather than it being due to like a specific anatomical or structural cause. And that's the pain generator. And you have to fix that in order to like get better. Cause that doesn't seem to be really evidence-based for a lot of non-traumatic injuries. And even in, sometimes in the case of trauma, it's just more complex than that. So we try to involve them early on in this education thing, which you usually don't get. Uh, so that's, that's fairly different. The, uh, another difference, and this tends to be larger and even magnitude, uh, happens to be with like how we're modifying exercises. So a, a lot of the, and, and movement in general. So a lot, a lot of the people that come to us, you know, tend to be really interested in getting stronger and in particular like squat bench, deadlift press. Uh, again, if you come to barbell medicine or you're a kettlebell king, like I don't, I don't know how you got here. I'm curious on your search, <laughs> on your search terms, but in, invariably these people are into uh, resistance training and, and most of them with barbells. And so instead of being like, Oh, you got knee pain, we got to do these three inch box step ups, you know, to terminal knee extension or whatever the, the thing would be with a, you know, TheraBand or pink dumbbell, no offense to the pink dumbbells. Uh, we're saying, well, we'll, instead we'll, we'll do a tempo squat or tempo pin squat slightly left parallel. We're just basically trying to find the most threatening movement that's most similar to what you would normally do so that we can kind of cut that curve off and get you back to your desired activity level faster. So that's the whole point. Like, what is the point of rehab? Restore, restore uh, uh, tolerance and capacity in your selected activities, right? And reduce discomfort while doing them. I mean, I don't really, uh, so we only go back as far as we need to, to kind of find the entry point. And that's markedly different. And, and part of that has to do with what you would see in a PT clinic, right? You go to a PT clinic, there's BOSU balls, TheraBands, and light dumbbells. And that's unlikely to be challenging enough or threatening enough for anybody who's done any modicum of resistance training. So that's like part one, part one of that difference. The second part is on the, in the unaffected areas, we're going to continue training as normal. If you got a lower extremity injury, we want you to bench press, you know, press uh, and do other upper body stuff so you don't lose any fitness and potentially even improve uh, your fitness in, in those areas. Um, and then the the other part of this is really trying to instill um, a lot of self-efficacy. It's actually a really terrible business model um, when you're trying to get people to be more self-sufficient. And by that, we mean being able to choose their own exercises on the fly because pain ebbs and flows, right? So instead of like needing somebody to tell you what you can and can't do, kind of giving you some constraints and some free, some leeway to like choose your own adventure. Uh, and then kind of in, in, when you're heavily involving the people in this process, you, they tend to need you less and less and less as their confidence builds. And so for our, our business would be great if we just said, yeah, you got to see us, you know, or contact us three times a week for 12 weeks. What we prefer is that we see you once in the beginning, give you some, you know, initial recommendations, check in with you as needed, you know, some of that's heavier at the beginning, lighter at the end, uh, but discharge you from care as soon as possible. Um, and so kind of between the education, the difference in movement active, uh, like recommendations and, um, you know, really instilling these sort of, uh, elements that increase self-efficacy. Those are all, that, that tends to be like the biggest difference. And, and it would be very obvious to anyone who's done a pain and rehab consultation with our team. If they went to a standard PT clinic, th- that your experience is completely different. You go into a traditional PT clinic, you may get some, you know, stim, they put the electrodes on you, zap you a little bit, a little ice, a little heat some range of range of motion stuff, and then maybe some manual resistance, or if they've got some dumbbells, you might lift that. Or if they have a kettlebell and happen to be again, kettlebell king or queen, you might do some unilateral kettlebell work. And we're more like, okay, skip all that bullshit that doesn't have evidence, mm-hmm. right? The stem, the heat, the cold, the whatever. Uh, let's get you under a bar if we can. If we can't, all right, we'll use dumbbells or a machine or whatever your preferences or whatever you have access to. And let's, you know, let's start as aggressively as we can. 
it doesn't mean we're tolerating like tons of, you know, discomfort while you're moving, but there's no reason to regress somebody further than necessary. Uh, and that's, yeah, it's kind of our ethos. Uh, yeah. And I think the final thing it deserves to talk that there's some discussion is, is many people are looking for a diagnosis of like, this is what happened and this is what's wrong with me. Right. They're like, my knee hurts because I have a meniscus tear or patellofemoral pain syndrome or, you know, some, there's some mechanical cause. And we typically don't go there unless it changes what we do. And what I mean by that is it's not really, it doesn't really matter what the specific diagnosis is and kind of thinking about perseverating on focusing on that specific diagnosis when it doesn't really change management tends to actually limit people's ability to get better makes them take longer because they think again, that there's something mechanically wrong with them that is limiting their progress. And so we, there's just really no reason to kind of go that deep or like we have to get subsequent imaging. We need an MRI or a CT or, you know, whatever. And it's like, unless it's going to change what we do, that's not really part of the, not really part of our standard care. Um, and it, it, it probably shouldn't be, but in PT clinics and, Injury rehab, uh, uh, you know, sort of specialists worldwide. That's that's kind of standard of care, and uh, not not really for us. So we're trying to disrupt a little bit, but again, I don't want to pretend that every other you know physical therapist or injury specialist out there is is bad because that's certainly not the case. We know a lot of great people in the industry, but unfortunately, we're still the minority, and uh, we prefer that to to change. Yeah, cool. Um, what, one thing you know, I think <clears throat> a lot of times when people think physical therapists. I would say most people probably associate it with, okay, <clears throat> or whatever that person might be. I, I go in, I see a person, they need to physically touch me, examine me, watch me go through things. Um, sure. It is, do you find it, is there like, is it an extra hurdle, an extra set of challenges doing this online or remotely, or <clears throat> are you able to just a, as effectively do it as you would in person? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're really aren't that many cases where you need to like lay hands on the patient to either get a specific diagnosis that would change what you do or like apply some sort of technique that makes them feel better. Um, in general, that's not the case, which is why we're like very light. If any, on any sort of manual therapy sort of recommendations, people, again, if I do an, ask me anything on Instagram or we do a Q and a, wherever it, invariably there's questions about massage, soft tissue work, you know, lacrosse ball stuff, foam rolling, whatever, you know, you, you name it. If you can rub on it, people have asked me about it. Uh, <laughs> but, and, and really the crux of it comes down to like what level, you know, what is the current evidence on that with improving outcomes? And if it's not that great or, or in, in many cases, there's no difference at all from like the clinical the time, uh, exposure to the, the professional in the clinic, uh, meaning like time spent talking with the, the, the doctor or PT or whoever, then we're not going to recommend it. And so you, you don't really have to be in person if you're not using that sort of stuff. Uh, like Dr. Ray, so he's a, you know, chiropractor, right? He went to chiropractic school, he's got all the licensure and everything else. And he's like, yeah, I'm not manipulating anybody because the evidence is not great for that. Uh, so I don't need to see somebody to not manipulate them. Um, yeah, the in-person stuff can be more useful uh, if you're having difficulty like building patient rapport online. Sometimes that can be challenging, um, particularly for uh, younger individuals like pediatric populations or older individuals where technology is kind of difficult for them. But for you know most most folks, you know, talking especially now and with the pandemic and everything, you know, getting on a Zoom call or Skype or FaceTime is pretty accessible and they're pretty you're used to it and. We don't really need to put hands on folks to, to figure out what we're going to do. Makes sense. Switching gears just a little yeah. bit. What do you think of the barbell Mimison uh, Instagram? Oh. <laughs> so, so yeah, okay. So there's, there's the, I think one of them, they stopped doing it, right? Like the, Yeah, I just the, did a little research this week and it looks like it's been like a month since they've posted maybe or something like yeah. that. I, I assume, so yeah, everyone initially thought that it was me, right? <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> Guys, if I want to just blast memes and use the business name, I would just do it from our main account or <laughs> yeah. my personal account. It would get more traction and you know, <laughs> controversy, whatever. So it's not it's not me. And then, but I do think some of his takes. I assume it's I assume it's a guy because the idea that a woman would make, <laughs> you know, a meme account. Yeah. I, look, 
uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Uh, but I, I just I assume it was, assume it was a guy. Uh, his takes were spicier than ours in general, <laughs> like calling people. <laughs> so on the one hand, I was like, I felt like I was like, man, maybe this is like my the the you know my ego or whatever the unfiltered sort of. Uh, uh, thoughts that I, I might have sometimes, and you just blast them. And so I was like, it was funny to, to see. Um, and then also, also to read the comments occasionally, because I'm like, oh, this is what would have happened if we <laughs> yeah. said this. So, maybe yeah. it was like a yeah. Fight Club Tyler Durden scenario yeah, where you actually yeah, don't yeah. know yeah. it really was. You. It really yeah. is you. You just don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, I've been, yeah, I've been tired. Uh, I was, used to be a lot more tired. Maybe in the middle of the night, I'm just taking all these memes. Why did my yeah. phone die overnight? Yeah. What the hell? So did that, did, did uh, that creator, like, have they ever, like, specifically reached out to you on things, or is it? To me, it's funnier uh, so if they this, haven't, but... No, so it's funny. I, I do know, actually, yeah, now now that I'm thinking about it, I do know who it was. Okay. I'm not going to name them. But the funniest part was, I think they they said something about... It was either they said something about Squat You directly, yeah, uh, and then somebody had, like, tagged Steffi Cohen in the comments, or it, and somehow they were, like, related, like, tagged in the same post. In, in any case, Steffi, like, slid into their DMs thinking it was us uh, yeah. uh it, was like, it was like we should hop on a podcast and, and to be fair i don't know that it's Steffi's like running her own account or whatever but i just thought it was funny that our you know a meme account <laughs> yeah. of our stuff that's what got the attention yeah. <laughs> yeah that's what got the attention i was like jesus christ we've been doing it wrong we should just yeah. be doing memes this whole time yeah it's kind of funny there is something to be said about a good meme do you have a particular f- favorite meme account or anything like that i suppose that that one would be one that you track a little bit yeah, so Dr. Nadolsky, Spencer Nadolsky, he, we, he calls himself the meme doctor. Okay. So he, we, I met him back when he was in medical school. He's a licensed physician, obesity specialist. And, and uh, yeah, so he, all the stuff is memes. But I, I, I follow him, obviously. Uh, was it functional memeology? I like that one. Um, there's this, oh, man, what is, it, it's escaping me now. It's, um, it's like it's very powerlifting strongman centric on memes, and so if you guys named it, I would probably know it. Uh, but it, subpar, uh, subpar powerlifting. Yes. Is a, yeah, yeah. 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 I fall. I. I or I get tagged invariably in these things. Yeah. I'm like, Damn it! <laughs> I already had. I already wasted my day. Guys. Like, <laughs> like, but I, I think it's fun, and I think it's it's actually interesting that if you were, you know, like in our position, you're trying to convey information uh, to uh, that's a, accessible and. Um, interesting and ultimately gets a wide like readership you would probably use memes regularly i just don't know that i'm creative enough to to like get get like get the memes while they're still hot like me right, I, I would probably right. make it after they've already gone flat and then people would be like okay boomer i'm like damn it i <laughs> i just i missed it i missed the well, window see, the thing about memes is that you only have to hit like one out of every 20 and people just remember that one hit True. and then the other the other 19 oh, just all your misses yeah. All right. Fair enough. Point. Fair enough. Well, if we start going like heavy on the memes, you know it is a result of this conversation. <laughs> okay, you, your business advice. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I'm like uh, pre genesis of barbell medicine. Yep. I'm not even exactly sure, but I, if if I remember right, you had some sort of affiliation with starting strength or Ripito or something. There is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so uh, right when I start went into medical school, I had gone to a, a starting strength seminar at Wichita Falls. So I went to Mecca, you know, yep. made my pilgrimage. <laughs> uh, and, and 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 I, and I think I had been in contact. I'd been on that forum for a little bit, right? Because I had been coaching people IRL and teaching them to squat, bench, deadlift, press. And at the time, you know, 2011 ish, 2010 ish. If you try to think about like what is a better text for learning about not only like the generalized movement mechanics but how to teach them and stuff like that i mean nothing else existed right that was like awesome right, the only thing right. we had prior to that was like deep squatter from dave tate and it's like mm, all right but this this thing seems a little bit more refined and and uh, uh so i was using that anyway so i went to the starting strength seminar i'd been on their forum for a while and rip basically deemed me worthy like you can coach yeah, nice you're yeah. underweight you're underweight you know eat this triple <laughs> chili yeah. cheeseburger and, yeah but uh yeah so um I got asked to start working seminars that same year. So shortly thereafter that seminar uh, that I, when I first went to, and then I ended up taking over their nutrition forum, or they didn't, they had a nutrition forum that at one point was ran by Lyle McDonald. Then they had a falling out with rip. And then it was ran by Johnny Payne. Um, I don't know if you remember that guy. He was the gray skull 
barbell dude from Philadelphia. Anyway, he was, he ran their nutrition forum for a little bit and then it had been like defunct for almost a year. Okay. And Rip was like, you got abs. Do you want to like do this? <laughs> I was like, I was like, sure. Yeah. I mean, I've been counseling folks, uh, you know, uh, nutrition during, in my strength and conditioning practice. And then now I'm in medical school and learning a lot about this and out of self-interest. So yeah, let's do it. So I did that till 2016 is either 16 or 17 and so yeah and during that whole time we were working with starting strength uh it was like barbell medicine was its own entity at that point for about five years but it was kind of like starting strength adjacent yeah. so when people like went to starting strength they'd see barbell medicine and vice versa um and so what happened starting strength started they they were at that at the time um where this like first little rift kind of cr- got created they were anti online coaching. They're like, we're not going to do it. You can't do online coaching, online programming because you can't see the person in real life and you got to put hands on the client to make them squat better, deadlift better, whatever. So that's all you guys at Barbell Medicine, like do your thing. It's programming consultation. And at that point, it was fine. They did, they changed in 2016. They started starting strength online coaching. And, um, at that, that, that was kind of the be- the beginning of the end because they were like, well, you can either you know, join SSOC or you could be barbell medicine. I was like, uh, I prefer to stay barbell medicine. It seems like my baby. And it seems like we're kind of different, right? Like we got this more medically minded, you know, trying to bridge this gap. And it seemed like we weren't really competitors outside of like the, you know, maybe a novice trainee who came to barbell medicine instead of starting strength, whatever. That was, that's kind of where it started. And then we, I mean, Mike Tushir had been coaching me since 2013. So now I'm four years into RPE, you know, really and using that kind of heavily. And I obviously enjoy it, believe in it. There's good evidence that it can, it can be used, not if it's the only tool, but it can be a useful tool. And then, you know, Rip kind of came out with all this RPE is bullshit, essentially yeah. useless for everyone thing. And we're like, oh, wait. Uh, and then, yeah, so that was, it kind of spiraled to the end. I mean, it, it, can, it ended up being about 50% probably business related and 50% RPE related, which is wild <laughs> to even like <laughs> to think about. And, but, but, but if I'm honest and I don't know that I've ever spoken about this publicly and you know, who knows, no, maybe no one listens this far into the podcast and this will all be forgotten, but probably <laughs> they'll, not. They'll if listen, I know the, yeah. yeah. If I know <laughs> we'll the tell internet, them that this is the spot yeah, to listen. We'll timestamp it. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> the, the thing, the thing that was interesting is when we, when we split. So, uh, a guy who works for Barbell Medicine now, but also used to work at Starting Strength, Tom Capitelli. We were in New Zealand uh, at the time. And so the time difference was kind of strange. And I remember we were going back and forth on emails and uh, with, with Starting Strength and, and eventually just said, so this is, they, they had take, taken me off the nutrition forum and we weren't scheduled to work any more seminars. So it's kind of like we were being a little ostracized from the company and we're like uh, this doesn't feel good are we like done here and yeah then the email back was like yep i think we're done here mm-hmm. so at the time we was yeah it was kind of you know weird but at the split we thought it was all amicable like i didn't dislike them they didn't dislike us but it got kind of nasty uh it, 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 it was weird it's like as soon as we split it, the whole rpe discussion and how it was bullshit escalated and how you know and then that kind of became personal they're like oh well the barbell medicine people they're not coaching you they're just telling you to use rpe I'm like uh, what that's it just kind of kind of got strange and and that was our entire like social and professional circle in this space all of the other coaches we were all friends at least i thought and then as soon as we got kind of like kicked out really or left nobody would talk to us anymore and and it was it was weird it just kind of felt like we had like the scarlet letter on us and um so yeah and invariably like austin was a starting strength coach leah was a starting strength coach tom was a starting strength coach Alan Thrall was the starting strength coach, right, right. and and we all we all kind of you know one by one turned our turned over our accreditation because we were like we don't really want to be a part of this if we're you know going to get the, we're spoken poorly of and 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 this is where we're going to be treated. So yeah, that was twenty seventeen, and uh, but but interestingly at the time I was a little bummed you know about how that all went down, and then I it actually probably was the best thing for our business right. as far as motivation to like all right well, cool now we really gotta step up our game we need to get on youtube we need to start a podcast we need a newsletter we need more content we need to just in- increase what we're doing and now we're focusing solely on our stuff 
And I, I, I think I never wanted it to be adversarial. Like, oh, fuck, fuck these guys. I, wait, can I say that? Are you guys PG thirteen or R? Oh, like, I don't. Yeah, that's explicit. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, fair. <laughs> I, I never wanted to be like, you know, f these guys. I, I, I hate them, and and they're all you know jerks or dumb or anything else like that. It, it just, you know, and some, and sometimes it kind of went that way where we would just get frustrated. And I just, I think we all want the same thing. We want more people to train, right? It, it's just as far as going about it. I, 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 I wish that there had been more, I don't know, flexibility as far as like, all right, what are the best ways to get people to train? What's like sort of an acceptable level of squish uh, or, or variance? Like, if it, is it okay if someone does a high bar squat instead of a low bar squat? Is it okay if they want to do fours or sixes or eights or tens and not just fives? <laughs> you know, I, and I'm no, this is I'm dead. I'm dead serious. Is, is it okay if a 60 year old guy who's got a fused ankle squats two inches above parallel or do you got to fire him because he's not squatting, you know, yeah. below parallel. And, and I wish that I was being, you know, a little like histrionic here, but I'm not. And, and so we just, it's like a fundamental disagreement. I, like I want everyone to train. And I don't have a like set standard where it's like, okay, well now you're training and before you were just exercising uh, or, you know, or, or what you were doing before was useless. I want more people meeting the physical, physical activity guidelines, specifically the resistance training portion of it by a uh, method or modality that is keeping with their preferences, what they have access to and something that they'll do for the next, you know, for ideally for life. And I, if it happens to be with a barbell, cool. But if the bar is an inch and a half higher on your back, and you, or you don't happen to look down or you have an aversion to sets of five repetitions, that's all fine. I'm going to be completely fine there. Um, and it just, yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't in keeping with the, that party. And, um, so anyway, I, in hindsight now, again, good it was It was good to leave, uh, helpful for our brand and development and kind of focusing our, our efforts. And then subsequently I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad that we got out some, Due to a lot of the comments that have come out of that camp subsequently, and I don't, I don't pretend to know everything that's ever gone on over there since we left, but uh, yeah, it'd be very difficult to be associated with that brand at this time, given all what's going on. And I don't know how plugged in you guys are into that uh, into that scene, but I get screenshots, or you, well, especially used to get screenshots all the time. Like, can you believe that? They said this, and I'm like, I mean, I can believe it, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, something I, I would say, uh, you know, after, uh, yeah, we follow their stuff. We follow along with your stuff. We, You know, we, we've, we you mentioned a lot of people. We've had Mike T on the show. We've had Alan Thrall on the show. We've had you now here. We've had Rip on the show in the past. And we, we've had a, you know, a wider group, and you know, that that's kind of adjacent to that. And just kind of being familiar with your stuff now and even listening to you talk, it's almost more weird for me to think there was a time when, your guys' um, overall visions aligned well enough that, that oh yeah that there yeah. were yeah that it that it worked uh, I guess as well as it it's it did for as long as it did kind of because yeah. you mentioned the word flexibility <laughs> when talking about uh, rip and like I think like that word doesn't exist in his, you know there. <laughs> We, no, you know, there's positives there's and negatives. Of every, yeah, for sure. Like everyone yeah. has pros and cons and stuff, but like, there's no doubt that there is no flexibility allowed in any of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I don't know. It's hard to say like you, you want to be charitable and kind to yourself when you're looking back on like decisions you've made throughout your life or how you used to act. And, and I think, I mean, I was in 2013, 2014, probably when I had my most prominent role at in starting strength like that that time i'm i was relatively new to strength the strength conditioning field outside of my own gym right so like being on the, a larger stage and so and and now you're associated with starting strength even though we started Bardo medicine already but you're you're kind of trying to toe the line and and, and also you were viewing i was viewing rip's success uh, as well and so i was really good at for lack of a better word, impersonating Rip, you know, adopting his, some of his mannerisms, some of the, the lines that he would say, because we were just trying to keep the message, you know, kind of, kind of tight. And, and I think if I, if I'm being honest, I, I think I was maybe lacking a little bit of critical analysis, you know, thinking like, well, is this stuff, is this a hundred percent correct? Like, are you, are you okay with staking your reputation on it? Um, because, because in, in hindsight, yeah, you're right. I, I think if I had taken a critical eye towards everything that was being said and and saying, you know, is this the final word here? Uh, I probably, there probably would have been some dissent 
earlier on. And then maybe this whole thing would have happened years prior. Uh, but yet it didn't. And so uh, it is interesting because after the split, uh, we got some, you know, the people who were, I guess, you know, it's like when you break up and you have some friends that like go with your ex and you get yeah. some of the friends and it's kind of <laughs> weird. The friends, the friends that stayed with the starting strength, they're like, so you guys were just bullshitting us before and you didn't believe any of this stuff. Or you're just changing your tune now so you can differentiate yourself and make money. And I'm like, well, I see, I see where you're coming from, you know, cause, cause it, it seems like it's, everything's different now, but I think just you, you grow and evolve as time goes on. And, you know, part of the, re- a lot of the reasons that we ended up splitting up have to do with just, I, you know, kind of ideology and differences and in, in how we want to approach this. And, uh, I, I don't have a, a better explanation other than that. You know, it's not like we're changing our tune just to be profitable or just because we split. It's just the reason we split is because we sh- we changed our minds. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of it's kind of we- it's kind of weird. You got to break up a business just because you change your mind. Like I hope I hope I'm thinking differently about stuff in ten years. <laughs> true. <laughs> well, right. True. It's, it's yeah. more weird to think like of ideas not progressing and changing over right. the course exactly. of exactly. Okay, that's the maybe the scarier part. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we all have friends that are like, I'm the same guy, 10 years, same person, never change. You're like, mm, but a lot of things, we've learned a lot of things in yeah. 10 years. You <laughs> yeah. should probably update your priors here. But yeah, yeah I, I, I don't harbor ill will tor- towards that. Again, I, I think some of the personal stuff is more on me and, and maybe, you know, how uh, deeply entrenched I was from a, you know, social and professional sort of standpoint in that, in that particular niche. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, things are, things are way better now. And I would love if all of us could be friends and get along and ultimately promote people being more active. But if you, if someone's going to take a hard line on like the low bar back squat, you know, activating more muscle mass or being the ideal squat or five reps being the perfect compromise and rep range, it's like, why are you doing this? Like, why do you just, what's the point here? Right? Like there's enough, there's enough market share for everyone that you don't have to like be that polarizing. You could, you know, just put out the good information, run a business, but you don't have to like make these wild ass claims. You don't have to be like the liver king of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> resistance training. Jesus, just say stupid shit the whole time. Anyway. All right. True. Uh, yeah. So shifting off of starting strength or that, that portion of in time, this, this is kind of a, um, question that's courtesy of the discord crew that i was alluding to earlier so i don't really know the uh context of this but it's probably okay. worth, a, worth a laugh at the very least um so what is your favorite strength training template and why is it five, oh, why is God. it five three one? Oh jesus <laughs> oh man this is funny i mean yeah so so one of the last articles uh, one of the things i was doing at starting strength was writing articles that were markedly different in tone and content than what had previously been published. You know, for example, there had previously been articles about like why squats won't hurt your knees and lower, like why low bar back squats superior to the high bar back squat, which cool. That's going to drive clicks, you know, views, whatever. But then I would write articles like uh, the anatomical considerations of the alternating deadlift grip or like pressing overhead from an anatomical standpoint, or in this case, programming. Uh, just analyzing uh, two different programs, comparing them to each other, and then you know trying to suss out like what are some variables that could be better leveraged. And so in this case, I compared the Texas method to five three one and like the suitability uh, of either as an intermediate program for those previously coming off of like the novice linear progression. And so I am in analyzing you know the volume and the average intensity and the exercise selection and this that and the other. And the conclusion I came to is that neither was really well suited for folks because all of the important exercise variables were not really tailored to somebody in that cohort, like right off of a novice linear progression. And right. so that these people, they need a gradual sort of influx of increased volume. They need some auto regulation. They need some conditioning that the exercise selection needs to be specific enough for their goals, all, all sorts of stuff, right? Like, I mean, just rehash the article. The problem is that this article got published the day before 
Wendler's newest version at the time of 531 was published. Uh. And so apparently the story goes that Wendler called Rip and basically, you know, chewed him out a little bit. And Rip was like, hey, man, sorry, I didn't know. Like, who the fuck knows when the next 531, you know, right. after, right. Dark, after Dark missed, Special is going to come out. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Sorry. Missed that. Uh, and so they got into it and then invariably people who are five through like diehard five through one fans were like this Feigenbaum guy, he's full of shit and, yeah. you know, bring out pitchforks. So I got caught wind that on um, power, our powerlifting people were like reviewing my article and, you know, basically in not in a kind or even academic way like if you do think if you have an academic discussion right like not everything's going to be like roses and rainbows but at least you know people are going to bring up points provide evidence counter arguments that's usually how this goes and so i got wind of this i got on there and i was basically trying to talk to these folks and and kind of support my position uh and i felt like i was doing an adequate job but things invariably spiraled out of control and the attacks became personal and uh i I, i'll be honest i don't think i was the kindest person so i'm like who 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 are you guys to be arguing with me like (laughs) because because if it's okay to disagree right it's okay to even to disagree with a professional uh or an expert or you know somebody with a lot of experience in the space even if you're not gonna call them an expert it's okay to disagree but like bring your receipts so like why are you disagreeing and where are you getting that from but it wasn't like that it was like no 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 because five three one works all the time or i used five three one or my cousin used five three one i'm like dude nobody uses five three one at the highest level no one's doing the shit when they're gonna use five three one right <laughs> and then like and then people are like well that's not actually five three one i'm like well then what is five three one because it's when it was defined by the person who made the damn program that's what I, that's the, the the definition i use and if you can't define it then it's not a thing right if you can't tell me what five three one is then five three one is everything and then therefore the term <laughs> is meaningless so let's it's so a, anyway yeah. that's 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 the that's like the where this started. So then, shortly thereafter, Instagram Lives became a thing, and I started doing Instagram Lives almost every day, kind of like an early adopter there, because I thought it was cool. People would ask questions, whatever, you answer them, and then the whole thing disappears into the ether. Uh, every day, five through one questions, and not from people <laughs> from the Reddit. From the, I got I got kicked out of our powerlifting. That's true. I got kicked out of our powerlifting. They were like, no, nope, we don't want this guy. But people would be like, what's, what are your thoughts on 531? Every, I mean, it became like a meme thing. People were like, would would yeah. regularly post, don't ask him about foam rolling, don't ask him about 531. Yeah. We've heard the answer a thousand times. Um, anyway, so that was 2016 ish. Uh, my, what, at that point, we had no templates available like for sale. And, but people would keep, keep asking me, like, well, how would you design a template? How would you design a program, whatever? And so I started putting some of these out. And, um, so all of the templates, uh, are very careful to not resemble anything like five through one, because I do not want that question. Uh, <laughs> like, Hey, you know, Hey, this looks a lot like five through one. Yeah. Um, and ulti- ultimately now, like the way where I've come like full circle, like, look, if someone wants to do five through one to meet the resistance training portion of the physical activity guidelines, and that's their preference, they like that structure, whatever. Great. Continue on you're fine. But if someone's asking me is 531, that structure, the nuts and butt bolts, the core of 531, which which is, you know, the main lift programming and how it starts with fives and an AMRAP, threes the next week and an AMRAP, ones and an AMRAP, you know, and then a deload. If someone's asking me if that is like ideal for strength, hypertrophy, or and or cardiorespiratory endurance, like, no, it's not ideal for any of that stuff. It's not even a good blend for any of that stuff so it's like why would you start developing a template from that that and that's that's the honest answer and people are gonna say well i've been on five through one for years now can you tell me it's bad i'm like if you've been on something for years and it's working for you why do you care what i have to say about it true <laughs> yeah, true so, seriously but if it's not working like maybe maybe uh just some changes so yeah five through one used to be like a bugaboo because everyone would ask about it and <laughs> and now yeah now it's it's interesting because i, I think uh, at, when's the last time that you guys trained in a commercial gym? I assume you guys train in like a cool gym. Yeah, we don't. Really, we're at. It's. I mean, we started ours six, seven years ago, so it's yeah. been quite a. We're fairly. It's almost like a foreign it. concept yeah. when we actually see one now. Yeah, like, God, yeah. that is a thing Dude, still. Wow. Yeah. yeah, I was in Scottsdale not this past weekend, but the weekend before for the waste management open, and uh, ended up going training at a commercial gym. It was like a hybrid commercial gym because they had like 
platforms, I guess. Yeah, and okay. like, right, right. Yep. Yeah, there was like one, an Elite FTS bench somewhere. I was like, okay. how did this get in here? Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, otherwise, lots of mirrors, lots of college students, and lots of you know cutoffs with with nipples showing. <laughs> like, I thought we. Yeah, we so don't strange. encounter any of uh, that, so it gets yeah. weird. But to think, like, to think that people are still dealing with that on a regular basis. Hundred percent. So I was like, I remember looking around. And I was like, I feel like that guy's doing five three one. I can feel it. <laughs> I can feel it. This dude. <laughs> but at that point, it, it's almost like a meme now, right? Like if you had like your, you know, if you try to think of like your worst encounter you could potentially have in a commercial gym, it would be like you're trying to find a squat rack, but there's only one squat rack, and this guy is doing, you know, his AMRAP set of five five three one, and then he recognizes you and then wants to talk about his program or something. Yeah, it would be yeah. something to that. Yeah. Yeah. Something to that effect. So anyway, that's probably more than you guys want to know about five, three, one, but no, that's, that's what happened. That, that all, I assume. We'll, that's, that's good. Sorry. There'll be some people very happy that we got to talk about that. So yeah, fair, fair enough. Okay. We've got this little game. We play with everyone, Jordan overrated or underrated. And we've got a special, uh, Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum set of topics handpicked for you. And right, we'll fire them off to you. It's just your job to decide if each one's overrated or underrated. You have to remember, though, you can't ride the line on any of them. You have to definitively <laughs> oh, come up shit. with an answer whether the, each one is overrated or underrated. And it, um, you have your druthers to um, elaborate as much or as little on each one. So All if, right. if you're ready, ready to play, we'll get into it. Let's do it. Okay. Overrated or underrated? Nuance. <laughs> overrated for sure i don't even i don't even know i started saying it again it was like instagram live like early instagram live i i i started saying it and it became like a like a like a tick i was like why am i saying this all the time it's like i can't stop and then and that, and then it became a thing where everyone would would like see somebody else use the word nuance i would get tagged or they would like be reading something they would take a picture of it and send it to me like see this word exists i'm like i know this word exists i don't know it was like a three week period where it became like every fourth word for me. So yeah, overrated. You guys can move past that. So are at this point, are you like, if does it ever come when you're, you're speaking and you, you come to something and you, you feel like there's a, a really appropriate time to use the word nuance. Do you find yourself avoiding yeah. using it now at this point? Yes. Unless I'm doing it for like, com- yeah. yeah, but unless it's for like com- comedic, comedic value. And yeah. so like, we'll be doing like a live seminar and I'll I'll be searching for a word. I can't find another word. And I'm like, here we go. And I look in, <laughs> into the crowd and I say nuance. And everyone's like, yeah, oh, you yeah, did, did the it. thing. It's like, yeah. Yeah, it's like a drinking wild. game. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> I'm a one trick pony. Yeah, it's terrible. So overrated for sure then on that. Okay. Overrated, yep. Okay. Overrated or underrated two stroke dirt bikes? Ooh, underrated. I come, yeah. So if you guys don't know this about me, I started by, I mean, how I got into resistance training was I used to race dirt bikes. Uh, I, now I, I just picked up another one, but it, and getting back into it. But I was racing dirt bikes. Uh, I had just gotten back from Loretta Lynn's, which is like the national amateur championship. Uh, I did okay there. I got 18th out of the 42 people that were there and like thousand people trying to qualify. That's a flex. I know, but I just want to get you the background. In any case, <laughs> the next, the, the next race I got landed on dislocated my hip, couldn't walk for nearly three months. And then part of my rehab, the, the home PT came and like, I was sitting on the couch and she was like, stand up. I was like, all right, cool. And then sit down and I did it. And she's like, stand up again. And she, she I was like, all right. She's like, you need to do this. I was like, squats. Uh, so anyway, that's how I got into resistance training. Like I was like, oh, I'll just go to the gym and start working out. And that's how I like got strong enough to start walking again. And that's how I got bit by the strength training bug. Cause I was like, this is like a lot of fun. Chicks are going to love this. It turns out it's just guys. It turns out it's just guys. It's, uh, guys, it, yeah. it's yeah, it's just dudes. Yeah. Um, but in any case, at the time, all, all the bikes were two strokes. So this was like 2003, the four stroke had like just come on the scene, but all my race bikes were two strokes. Uh, and then when I came back to racing after college, everything's four stroke. And so now I, I personally currently have a Husqvarna 2022 Husqvarna 450. So it's a four stroke. Um, but I'm on the lookout to get into vintage racing. I want to pick up a 96 Honda CR 252 stroke Jeremy. I want a Jeremy McGrath replica yeah. so I can do, go do some of these Evo vintage races. But the point is, if you're like, if you're only slightly curious into like dirt bikes, motorcycles, motocross, two stroke is like, it's like classic. It's like a classic, uh, nostalgic kind of bike. It, you know, when you hear the motorcycle noises, 
for like dubbed over right, right. That's movies the here. Ring, 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 ring. Yeah. It sounds like a wee whacker, right? Yeah, no, it's great. Four strokes. Look, they're fun. They're easier to ride. I get it. They're more powerful, torquey. That I don't care. I want the near death experience. <laughs> uh, and yeah, two strokes. So underrated. Most people don't ride them right now. I ho- I wish they would make a comeback, but I don't. I don't see that happening. Uh, do they still? Do any of the big companies continue? Do they make any new two yeah, stroke so- motorcycles or? Honda, or sorry, yeah, Yamaha and KTM, and then KTM now has two other brands that are basically the same motorcycles but in different color plastic. So they Husqvarna and Gas Gas are both basically their KTMs in different colors. Uh, they both they all make two strokes. So Yamaha, KTM, Gas Gas, Husqvarna makes new two strokes. None of the other manufacturers do, however. So uh, they basically two strokes got pushed out of pro racing for a few reasons. One the pro racing rules uh made the the fuel uh the fuel rule where you couldn't use leaded fuel anymore it's only unleaded uh so that really brought down the power of the two strokes secondly the pro the pro rules give four strokes double the displacement of engine size that two strokes have so previously it was a 125 cc and 250 cc classes and then the four strokes could be 250 cc and 450 cc sizes and so you're thinking like oh well you two stroke or four stroke double displacement uh yeah that makes sense but the horsepower difference is right. insane mm-hmm. it's insane so two strokes dead in pro racing and because it's dead right. in pro racing the manufacturers really don't yeah. want to invest yeah. a lot in this that makes sense yeah. so my one uh, little <laughs> a- anecdote on that is I, I had when i was about 20 i had bought a kx 125 which is a two stroke uh, kawasaki and i'm not particularly agile or <laughs> particularly small i'm not small either you know at the time i was probably six three two fifty or something like that and oh god on uh, a 125 jesus yeah, yeah and i um took it out to the like our local little track and like the first jump I, the first significant jump of any significance i went off i cased the jump and like smashed my knee into the handlebars and you know, like, like had a, a fair contusion there, and I was like, "Yep, I'm selling." Uh, as this. I say, I already can't picture yep. doing any yep. of this. Standard. this yeah, no, like I, I don't. Yeah, I, like this sounds made up to me. Is that it? and then like I f- was constantly fouling plugs on it. You know, there's there, you know, the two stroke. Uh, it's it's just it's not as sim- It's I don't know. Maybe it's more simplistic. It? Maybe it's less. But like, there's um, you know, the maintenance of it is there's something to be said about. Uh, how easy maintenance can be on a four four stroke too. But um, after I cased that jump and smashed my knee, I was like, this is not for me. I don't know why I'm doing this to begin with. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I, I, I will. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, well, yeah. So I, your your listeners are probably like, dude, you guys you guys are really talking dirt bikes. I was like, <laughs> look, man, I, I, I live for this stuff. So invariably now that I've like gotten into powerlift, I've been in powerlifting for a while and people primarily on the internet know me as a lifter doctor dude. They're like, are you sure that motorcycle is a good idea? I'm like, no dude, it is a terrible <laughs> right, idea. Right. But I li- I was raised in this. I live for this stuff. I know all the pros. I know what, who their sponsors are. I've been following the series for as long as I've been alive. And like all this, like all of the models going back, you know, since basically I was born, I got all them. I have stacks of magazines in print mag, like magazines dating back to the mid nineties on dirt bikes. Like I'm a avid, avid enthusiast. And so that's why I love it so much. I'm like, yes, the risks of riding dirt bikes from an injury perspective are substantially higher than literally anything else especially like not riding dirt bikes but it's like (laughs) yeah but but like i'm not just waiting to die right like i i love it brings me great joy uh and so you know if you're thinking about maybe commenting on my instagram about how i should stop riding dirt bikes (laughs) the next time i get injured (laughs) just just know that it's really important to me and maybe maybe don't say that no (laughs) it's it's fine yeah uh, and talking about the danger of it, just some other limited experience, like talking about the 250 two stroke or now the 450 uh, common four stroke. Those are for anyone that hasn't ridden dirt bikes. Those are literally like hell on wheels. Some of the scariest <laughs> yeah. crap. Like if you, especially if you're not like yeah. a, accustomed to it, it is insane what those do actually. Yeah. I, um, I, so I was out, this is probably, it's three weeks ago actually today. Uh, so Southern California is like the Mecca for dirt bikes. There's like all the cool tracks, all the pros ride out here to practice during the week, even though if they're like, you know, 
racing on the weekend. This is where they practice. So you get to see all the big names and all the, yeah, like I said, all the cool tracks are here. And now I live here and I'm like, oh man, I can finally live out my childhood dreams. It's like all I needed, like the Jinko pants and the Etnies <laughs> to like really yeah. tie everything together. So in any case, I'm out at Lake Elsinore. Uh, I'm riding around and um, my dad used to race professionally back in the seventies. And then he was a mechanic at factory Kawasaki for their race team. So he's been, you know, yeah, go figure. I took after my dad, like I was, we were in this together. So in any case, I was out there riding the main track. There were a bunch of, there was a bunch of pros out there and they were like, you know, kicking the crap out of me. Cause now I'm 40 pounds too heavy to be good at motocross. And, uh, I haven't been on the bike, you know, it'd been, it's been some years. So anyway, my, I pull over my dad's like, what are you doing, dude? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you're going really slow. You just, I don't know. Like, why are we here? And I'm like, damn, it's like Leonard just hitting me with, hitting, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I'm like, bombs. I'm a grown ass. I know I'm a grown ass man. I don't need to take this. But what really happened is like the younger, the kid in me was like, I'm going to show my dad that I'm good. <laughs> and so I, I go out there full send, like, you know, again, not smart, not riding within my current capability, but maybe where I, you, where I used to be. I over jump this jump, land in a mud hole, bike completely stops. I flip over. I dislocate my shoulder. My get up, I get up, I see the bike in mud. My shoulder is dislocated anteriorly. And I'm like, nobody's around me. It's at least a 15 or 20 minute walk back to the truck. The bike's stuck in mud. My shoulder really hurts. I got to pop this thing back in right now. So I, I put it back in. I pick the bike up, ride it over to my dad. And he, he goes, he goes, Oh, what the fuck did you just do? And I was like, <laughs> this is your fault. Dad. Yeah, you yeah. did this. <laughs> you, you did this. But yeah, that was on a new 450, right? It's like brand new. And these things, you know, when I invariably people were asking me like, well, how fast were you going? I'm like, I mean, I don't know, like 30 miles an hour tops, 25 miles. It's not the speed, the velocity, right. but like you're going right. Like a car crash. It's at the, I came down from maybe two and a half stories right. in the air <laughs> right? and I, and then instead of like having a smooth arc going forward, I just like stopped and then an object in motion continues in motion. And that was yeah. me flying through the air into the hard terra firma. So, and you know, you were 230, 240 riding a 125. I'm, I'm 210 right now. And when I was racing, I was 160, 170 pounds. And so uh, you would think that extra padding is like useful. It really just gets in the way. Yeah. You're really just like just makes more you inertia. Like, right, right. Yeah. That's yeah, more, yeah. yeah. Okay. No, that's Terrible. good. Uh, overrated or underrated vitamin D supplementation? Jesus. Overrated. <laughs> and, yeah. Har but uh, yeah. And it, this is like become, this is Austin's bugaboo right now because everyone, well, not, and this isn't a new development, but vitamin D has, you know, been recommended by various you know, pseudoscience promoters all over the internet and even in, in press for a long, since it's been discovered, you know, um, the problem is, is, is not that there's no data showing a correlation between vitamin D levels and health outcomes or health trajectory. That data is robust. And what I mean by that in very simple terms is that there are plenty of studies, thousands, if not tens of thousands of studies showing that individuals with lower levels of vitamin D in their blood tend to have more disease. Meaning that uh, if you were looking for a relationship between chronic kidney disease and low vitamin D levels, you can find that. If you were looking for a relationship between obesity and low vitamin D levels, you're going to find that. Uh, cancer and low vitamin D levels, you're going to find that. Heart disease, low vitamin D levels, you're finding all of that. The real problem is that correcting the vitamin D level by, by a supplementation does not change the health trajectory. So even though you've shored up the lab value of low vitamin D, it does not affect heart disease risk, does not affect obesity, does not affect cancer risk, you know, name a disease, doesn't affect it, except for a very small select few, one being uh, maybe uh, osteoporosis uh, and then chronic kidney disease or other diseases where you're not actually uh, able to make any vitamin D. Um, so the, the takeaway here is that just because things are correlated doesn't mean that they're causative. Just because things are correlated doesn't mean that they're causative. And in fact, there's a really cool website. I may DM this to you, Tanner, because I just, I had, I, I could not stop laughing, <laughs> but it just shows all these wild correlations. And if, if you took statistics a long time ago, this is your brief refresh. The R value is effectively like how closely things are related. If it's one, there's a perfect correlation. 
right? A perfectly positive correlation. And if it's negative one, there's a perfect negative correlation. And if it's zero, there's no correlation. So in any case, the per capita consumption of cheese correlates with the total revenue generated by golf courses and has an R value of (laughs) 0.9899999. And it's like, (laughs) what? There's all these websites or all all these correlations rather that are just wild. There's a lot of, some of them are like, uh Nicolas Cage films and like Death by Drowning. And it's just like <laughs> just weird it's weird that are almost weird perfectly correlated. But almost yeah. perfectly correlated, but yeah. obviously not causative. Right. And so right. just if, if people want like a bigger background in this vitamin D thing, it looks like vitamin D levels are basically a surrogate marker for like health status, in particular infl- inflammatory status. So most diseases have some level of inflammation that's kind of causing them or at least a result of the disease process itself. And that actually tends to lower vitamin D levels. And so when you get a low vitamin D level, all that's saying to me as a physician is that mm, health, there may be some health issues either under like underlying or, or, you know, you have an existing diagnosis that's causing this low vitamin D level. It's not something that we can fix by supplementing vitamin D. Rather, we need to actually address the root cause to the extent that it's mm-hmm. treatable or manageable. And so if you look at it through that lens, then you're like, well, yeah, of course, fixing the vitamin D level isn't going to do anything because you're not treating the, the cause. It's like, yep, you, you just nailed it. You just literally summarized thousands and thousands of vitamin D papers, and now you can rest peacefully without your vitamin D supplement. Oh, that makes, makes sense. sense. Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, overrated. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Market. Uh, Market. Okay. Yeah. This is our next one's our last one. And the last one's always the most important. Uh, it's kind of worth all the marbles. So overrated or underrated golf carts. Ooh. Uh, yeah. I'll also say overrated. Okay. And now, and now we get to bring some, wait for it, nuance to this discussion. <laughs> okay. So, so, okay. Take a shot. Okay. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah. Right. It's a drinking game. Feigenbaum bingo. Uh, so, <laughs> so golf, uh, is one way, uh, where that people like to spend their leisure time, um, and can be, it can be useful for meeting the current physical activity guidelines. Uh, ideally if you're drinking a bunch or doing recreational drugs on the golf course, it probably doesn't count, <laughs> but, uh, but count, yeah. count us out then. Uh, counts double, yeah, kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so people who take a cart on average will take somewhere between 5,000, 6,000 steps playing 18 holes. Whereas people who will walk a course, now obviously this depending on the topography of the golf course and the, and the length of the golf course. So the longer, I would also say highly dependent on the skill of the golfer too. Uh, true. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Where you're hitting it, right. You just hit it straight every time. It's going to be less. Um, but on average, it's it on average, it's somewhere in that, uh, 14,000 to 16,000 steps. Uh, sort of range. So taking a golf cart isn't, you're not getting no activity, but you're getting substantially less than if you were walking. And so I think um, walking can be obviously a very uh, useful uh, form of physical activity if you're on a golf course, especially if you're carrying a bag, because again, that's like walking with load. And so if you're wondering like, oh, I wonder how much more energy you're using. There's there's this, uh, it's called the MET compendium chart of physical activities. They update this like every 15 to 20 years basically is a collection of all the different like physical activities that you can imagine and how many uh, how much energy it uses for you to do it uh and it's oddly specific oddly specific it's like walking on flat surface at 3.5 miles per hour carrying a 15 pound pack and you're like oh that's not so weird and then it's like walking backwards uphill carrying a 40 pound pack on your back on the front (laughs) there's there's sexual positions in there and you're like okay again who's measuring this why is this in here why why can't i click out of the screen it's so crazy um so yeah I, it can be a very useful like uh and accessible way um to engage in um some physical activity to help meet the guidelines and so i think if you can walk and you can't you know if that's something that you can do i 10 out of 10 would recommend it. And my pet peeve here is that there are many golf courses that I've been to some of the nicer ones that will not let you walk because they're really, afraid really? it's going to take. Yeah. So Slow the New Year's we were pace of play. Yeah. That's yeah. And I, I understand that like the average golfer 
well, this is a, this is a whole other point, but you know, it's the last question, uh, and I'm your guest, and uh, you <laughs> you've you got, can edit you've this out if you want. Druthers. You have your druthers. That's right. You got, that's right. Your that's right. So uh, people will ask very frequently, like, oh, I, sh- I want to exercise for golf. Like, what do I do? And I'm like, well, the general my general recommendation would be like, just start exercising and meeting the physical activity guidelines using the broad variety of different exercises that train all the major muscle groups through a fairly wide range of motion using a variety of rep schemes. Uh, movement patterns, et cetera, that's auto-regulated. And they're like, that seems like the same prescription you would give to like a new trainee. I'm like, exactly right, because most of the people who play golf are under-trained and under-active. So we don't need like this highly specific like golf training program, right? Because most people don't exercise, which, you know, ergo, most golfers don't exercise. So if I was like a superintendent or like a starter or whatever, and I had a long golf course, so really long yardage with a lot of hills or whatever, and all these, you know, out of shape or undertrained people were like, oh, I want to walk. You're like, bro, we've got legitimately a tea time every 12 minutes. There's no way you're going to be able to keep this pace up. And so that kind of makes sense to me from like the logistical standpoint of the golf course. But me personally, it pisses me off. I was at uh, in Hawaii at Kapalua, uh, which is on Maui. And this course is like Jurassic Park meets golf like huge hills, huge, like wild grasses, sick ocean views with like, I assume with our volcanoes in the background, probably. And I was like, this is going to be excellent to walk. I'm psyched. PGA tour players do it because they play a tournament there. So right. surely I can walk. And the guy's like, absolutely not. There's no way you can walk this. And I'm like, God, look at me. All right. <laughs> I'm going to be, I'm going to be fine. He goes, yeah, you'll be fine. But the problem is other people are going to want to start walking and they're not you. And I'm like, and I appreciate the hype. I understand what you're talking about, but I appreciate the hype. Thank you so much. So, yeah, they go, I understand that, you know, having a golf cart is convenient. You're going to carry a bunch of stuff, especially if you're drinking with your buddies and that's how, what you use golf for. That's fine. Just meet your physical activity guidelines yep, uh, in another manner. Have fun. Do your thing. But if, you know, you're using golf as like your GPP or conditioning or just, you know, general physical activity, I take the damn cart. You're going to get almost three times the number of steps. Uh, you're going to be carrying a bag. So it's like, you know, it's basically strongman endurance. Do your, do your thing. Uh, plus, you know, if you happen to hit the ball off the planet, you don't have to do the ride of shame across the fairway. You just walk <laughs> straight to your ball. So, yeah, that's my that's my rant. I don't know if any of that makes sense. But overrated golf carts. Fuck them. I don't want them. Uh, yeah. Good news. uh <laughs> Looks like you passed overrated, underrated. It is a, <laughs> Did it I? is a pass fail course and you pass. So that's excellent news. I'd like to thank everybody at your discord channel for <laughs> correctly, correctly predicting how I would answer and asking the good questions. That sounds like a good crew. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is. No, good. That, that was really good. We understand. Uh, is it right that you're going to be at the Arnold sports festival in Columbus, Ohio here uh, in about a yep. week? Next week, yeah, I'll be there. Claire Barbell Medicine, aka Claire Zai, is uh, she's lifting in the Grand Prix. So, chance to, I think, the, the purse there for the women, the, the winner gets $5,000. Nice. So, we're going to be battling for that cash. Leah Lutz is uh, also competing Friday at the Masters. I, they have some name for it. I'm just going to call it the Masters Throwdown, but it might be like the Masters Challenge or yeah, Classic. Showdown or, uh, yeah. It's never like a polite term. Like the ma- the, the master's master's, master's yeah. potluck, yeah, master's potluck. Like that's what I want to show up to. Yeah. Like, come on, where's where's there gonna be snacks? Yeah. Uh, are, you, are you guys gonna be there? Yeah, we'll we'll have a booth there, and uh, we're somewhat chained to it. But if you uh, ever get the opportunity, please stop by, and we'll uh, we'd like to meet yeah. you in person. Are you guys gonna have Miller, or what's the deal? Like, do you guys, do you bring refreshments? How's that work? We it depends on what their policy, how close closely they are at uh, guarding the. Uh, the, that the coolers through the entrance. It so, sometimes on the they're kind of yeah. just oh, cooler. We don't care. And other yep. times they go, Oh, we got to look inside that. Yep. You know, it's weird. Cause they're like, there's going to be people just giving away, you know, toxic levels of energy <laughs> drinks, <laughs> yeah, tainted supplements, yeah, yeah. you know, Powders uh, you know, with- Oh, yeah, and pe- yeah. people just walk through there and just like take one after the other too. Like, it's just like, yeah, no holes barred anabolic adjacent materials and they're worried about <laughs> us sipping some rocky top come on man like let's 
let's get it together, Arnold. No, it'll be fun. Yeah, I'll I'll come by and say and say hello. Unless unless Jim Wendler is there, in which case I will not be showing. <laughs> I will not. Well, be it is showing it up. is in Ohio. Although based on the not, I don't know Jim know that much about him, but I'm guessing it's probably not his favorite place to go. Anyways, if I had, to I bet. would assume not. Yeah. I, yeah, I see. And we'd, we'd get over it. We'd just talk motorcycles, I think, after the initial, yeah. like, hey, man, aren't you that, that guy? I'm like, eh. <laughs> It was a weird time for me, man. Yeah, you know, we're gonna we're trying to get Rip and uh, Jim there at the same time, and when we do, we'll we'll call you over. <laughs> Fuck yeah, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. Yeah, yeah. Interpersonal skills at RP, yeah. man. It's gonna be a, it's terrible. Uh, that makes me really excited to think. Of it it yeah. was actually just the the booth was just a long con to yeah, orchestrate to get, this meeting. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, next year it says all my exes are gonna be there too. And I'm like, come on, guys. Like, <laughs> Give me a feels break, like you guys man. were up to something here. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, it felt fishy. No, that, that was great. We were excited to get you on. What if, uh, you know, I mean, probably people just Google barbell medicine, but where, where do people find out more if they uh, need to do that? Yeah, sure. Do the website, barbellmedicine.com. That's where all our content is and any of our coaching services uh, or templates supplements apparel all that stuff is there we also have a youtube channel barbell medicine uh instagram all of the barbell medicine crew is basically underscore barbell medicine after their name so mine is jordan underscore barbell medicine austin underscore barbell medicine etc and then we have a main account which is just barbell underscore medicine because i couldn't figure out how like should it be a hyphen or should it be like a Mm. period yeah i know i have regrets but uh (laughs) but yeah no, nah, I know. Yeah. You know the most com- the most common question I get about barbell medicine, like what if I wear a barbell medicine shirt, is do you know Alan Thrall? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Like, you know he's associated with barbell medicine. Like, oh yeah, it's crazy, man. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's crazy. Thanks yeah. for slapping me in my face. <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm just yeah. I'm just gonna go over here and cry now. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, no, no, thanks. And a pod podcast too, right? I mean, you pump out oh, regular shit, episodes, yeah. on, and I, a really good podcast too. I think you probably have quite a few listeners. I would assume. Yeah, yeah. No, the podcast's doing well. Yeah, we try to again. We're just bringing uh, strength conditioning to modern medicine, and vice versa. And we get, we have some good guests, and uh, try to really uh, go deep on on things we think will be both entertaining um, and informative. So, yep. You, anywhere that there's like social media or like the ability to like post information, you search barbell medicine, we're probably there. And uh, I really appreciate you guys having me on, man. This was, this was real fun. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Good, good stuff. We'll see you soon then. Sure. Thanks. All right. Thanks, thanks Jordan. Tommy. Cool, cool beans. Beans. Cool beans. Cool beans. He got those cool beans. Got the double cool beans. Got the double he? cool beans. Well, that was good. That was fun. Yep. And we got into we got to go into the weeds on all we the uh, controversial all stuff. All the all the inside deets on it. Yep. Oh um, yeah, the Arnold's coming quick. Um, we, I suppose. Would you say we're really deep into our Arnold prep right now? Well, so this will come out on the twenty eighth, and we'll be leaving three days after that. A couple I mean, days it is, after this that. This is Arnold Week for people listening to this. Yeah, but we're gonna, and we're going to record one more episode here prior to us leaving to the Arnold. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. In that episode, maybe we'll talk about the Arnold a little bit more. Oh know, yeah, right, know. right. Maybe, maybe we should because we are actually going to record one in a couple of days. Right, here, so right. Maybe I mean, we should spare ourselves. Then, yeah, maybe we won't talk give about us something that. to talk about. Right, right. right. Maybe that's, we'll do a Q and A for that one. This next yeah. next episode might be a Q and A here. Good idea. And then we talked about it. We're probably going to record one on the way home from the Arnold road trip episode. So it'll be again. fun to work out the logistics of. Um, you know, doing that. We haven't done that for a long time. It's, it's certainly a, very a different. Long time. Yeah. But I, I think you brought up a good point. We'll be all hyped and excited. Uh, it's just coming so back easy from to it. talk about stuff. Well, essentially, we'll be in the vehicle having that conversation for 20 hours. Yeah, we might like, as well yeah, just put Might out, as well turn the camera on yeah, and read right, a couple ads while we're right, at it, right? Right. <laughs> Especially while it's all so fresh in our mind. Yeah, yeah. It makes it easier that way. So that'll for sure be cool beans. Was there anything else this week that we I don't know if you caught Jeopardy, Tanner. Oh, but there was I, a little bit of a geographical <laughs> highlight on there. Actually, it's funny on Facebook. I, you know, you should. You tagged Massonomics on Instagram of that. So uh-huh. I shared that to our Instagram story. And I usually check Facebook like once a day or something like that. or mm-hmm. how, Not frequently, but I do check it periodically. And it's funny, like I scrolled through and like the first like five things were people 
sharing of the Jeopardy. Yeah, see that, thing. Yeah. yeah. It was it was funny how it worked for us because we turned the TV on and I wasn't really paying attention. I turned the TV on and my wife just goes, they just said Aberdeen. What? Yeah. And I'm, I kind of wasn't really paying attention still. Yeah. I'm like, what? She's like, rewind it, rewind it. And we go back and, yeah, what was it? Uh, this is uh, one of five. Or what even was the question now? Our Aberdeen is one of five cities with a population of over 20,000 in, in this Midwestern yeah, state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and what it was. the guy buzzed in right away. And he said West, and I'm like, no, he's not going to yeah. do it. Western Northeast South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> but no, he said West Virginia, which really last time I checked, it wasn't a Midwestern state, right? No, and actually, there's been continued debate uh, through the Discord in various places about South Dakota's position in Midwestern. You know, this has been something mm-hmm. we've revisited several times, and a lot of people would say it's in the Great Plains region, yeah, but rather that's not, than. That, is that Midwest? That's and that's really a, a region, though, that I'm familiar with. It de- it's so, uh, it's such a weird thing like because at, people divided in, so, like, I saw a map that was divided into, like, 30 different yeah, regions. Yeah, the, the map I'm familiar with, the, or the one in my head, is maybe the most broad. You have, like, the northeast, yeah, right. the east coast, yeah, the south, the southwest, the west coast, the northwest, and the midwest. Right. And maybe even like the Rocky Mountain area. Right, right. The, like that, to me, that's <laughs> yeah, that's the regions right there. But what even even people that want to debate that we're not Midwest, we're Great Plains, a lot of them, like the map I saw today that someone posted, the Great Plains actually wasn't all of South Dakota. Yeah, because it, it, it was, doesn't you work. Know, you it, can't, Western South Dakota, right. part of it is the Great Plains, but there's whole parts of it that you're like, if this is the Great Plains, this makes no sense. Or exactly. And like... um. My point being, most of them that I see still puts Western Northeast South Dakota in the Midwest. Yeah. You know, it's still... Well, it's as... Like, you know, we're going we're gonna to live this in a week, but the drive from Aberdeen to Ohio almost feels like you went nowhere because right. the only thing that changes is there's a few more trees right. and slight, slightly bigger hills. But if you do just go west of us three hours, it starts to change Oh, yeah, it does change very drastically, yeah. yeah. But yeah, that trip of like 18 hours, it almost doesn't change. I mean, when we went to Kansas City for that thing, right? Um, I hadn't been down that way in a long time. And the only thing that changes, you have a few more trees and some rolling hills. Do you think uh, we'll come across any red robins on our trip or not? I, I'm going to keep an eye out. Yeah. We'll find out. We'll find out. We To be continued. <laughs> <laughs> that one's not done yet. No. You know what else isn't done yet? What? Spud Inc. Oh. And they're a sponsor of this show. And I wanted to tell you specifically about one of their products, the Gateway Briefs. They've got single ply and double ply. ply. They've got them both. But I want to talk about the single ply version. Whether you're just entering the world of geared powerlifting or you're a pro who needs a milder set of briefs for your lighter squat and deadlift days, the Spud Inc. Gateway Briefs are the answer. The easy on, easy off Gateway Briefs provide mild hip compression that supports and warms your joints while enabling you to overload your squat and deadlift safely without risk to your hips. And if you're just learning the geared squat, the gateway briefs can give you an easier transition than traditional briefs. Uh, they got several sizing that accommodates pretty much anyone. Uh, like there again, I was talking about the single ply. They do also have the double ply. I've worn these before. I would describe them if you've the single Tanner, ply. You can be honest. You're wearing them right now. I never take them off. That's how comfortable <laughs> they are. I like my ball region to be constantly sweaty <laughs> under extreme yeah. pressure. Yes, pressure and sweat <laughs> for extended periods of time. I don't want my balls. I to find breathe it smells ever. really good <laughs> when I take them off. Eventually, <laughs> if my balls are breathing. I'm not happy. No, the single ply ones. Uh, if anyone's ever worn the Reband warm pants, it's a step above that, but not that far beyond that. It, you know, if I would say it doesn't feel like you're wearing, you know, when you watch the guy's uh, squat it's on. It's more like a hot pant than a warm pant. There you go. That's that's the next step, right? Mm-hmm. But it's not like where you're all of a sudden you magically can lift a thousand No, pounds. no, no. But uh, it does feel good. And for someone that's maybe experiencing some pain, maybe it's something that helps them through that. I don't know. Good product, though. Thank you, Spud Inc. I want to tell you about another good product, Tanner. And that is the Texas Power Bar. I love it. Buddy Caps first started lifting weights in the late 60s and began powerlifting in the mid-70s. At the time, he was working for Image Barbell, building gym equipment. Around 1976, a local machine shop started making Olympic bars for them 
calling it the Image Bar. In 1977, Image Barbell became Champion Barbell. It was then that Buddy started looking at the bars with an intent of changing them for the better. In 1979, Buddy bought his first lathe to begin addressing the known issues. In 1980, his passion, drive, and purpose now had a greater mission. Buddy set out on his own to make what he believed was the greatest bar he'd ever seen and trained with, and the Texas Power Bar was born. It was strong as a house with the best knurling and was maintenance-free. Hundreds of state, national, international, and world powerlifting records have been and continue to be set and broken on the Texas Power Bar. To learn more about Texas Power Bars and buy one of their legendary bars, visit TexasPowerBars.com. We had a new sign, someone sign up to become a supporting member right while we were recording tonight. So what? thank you. Thank you, Big Noah, for signing up as long as you're, it's yeah, fresh in my you. mind. Thank you for everyone else that has signed up this month. Big month for supporting members. Great month for supporting members. Just when you think things can't get any more active, yeah. they get more active. It is a really active community. I don't know if we talked about that earlier. It really is. Very uh, active. Also, what else has been active is our sales of the Lift Shorts 3. Make mm-hmm. sure to get a pair. If you've been on the fence, now's the this, time to do it. Yeah, jump off there. Jump into the deep end. And also, the Natural for Life tea has been selling like hotcakes. Good chance. Yeah, we're going to. Your gonna, size might not have any. Inside. We don't have many of those left. And then also the Logo Block tea, Business in Front Party in the back. We've still got that in most sizes also, mm-hmm. so jump on, on that it. too. And then otherwise, we're taking everything else to the Arnold, so if we run out of stuff for yeah, a while... Inventory yeah. starting pretty soon here. could be looking pretty low until yep. we get back. Yep. And depending on how the Arnold goes, it might even be low after we get back. Fingers crossed, am I right? I <laughs> Wipe knock, that sucker out. Knock on wood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have anything else? Uh, I think that's probably everything. Should we wrap it up and put a bow on it? I think we might as well. All right. uh, Tommy, where do they find you at? You can find me at Tomahawk underscore D. You can follow me at Tanner underscore Bear. Just make sure to follow Massonomics at Massonomics. See you.